the report. So the, the purpose of this is to overview the report uh, uh, verbally for the entire board. Um, and also I believe we'll be able to pull up um, updates that uh, both the, the highlight of the review of the executive committee and the work the executive committee has done between uh, in the intervened few weeks. All right. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have a full agenda, so I'm just going to double. <laughs> no, we know that this is an important issue, and we plan right. to. So I'm just going to double check on time that you're allotting for this. You think? I till we get through it. Till we get through yeah. it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just. Yeah. I know everyone out there is really excited about that part of it. But. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was excitement. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> More than you've ever gotten, right? <laughs> well, almost. I've gotten a little bit more one time. Okay. So as. Uh, as we kind of we kind of look through this, uh, it the first page here just goes through the. Um, I'm just trying to get mine to sync up here. The first page just goes through the the process itself. Um, so as you all are aware, uh, as as the chair said, is to deepen the, your understanding of roles and responsibilities, to review your input on. Excellence in governance, excellence in management, the committee structure, and open up, see what other issues that you had. As you all of you are aware, you participated in a survey. Um, thank you very much. I, we all had individual uh, conversations uh, with you and the superintendent and I. Then I did is I took all of the information off of the notes and crafted some key findings and clarification, which are on the next page. So the key findings as to the strengths is that uh, superintendent and key cabinet members are strongly recognized for their knowledge, their skills, professionalism, responsiveness, and partnership. And so I think that was across all board members. So broad recognition of that, as well as your adherence to Minnesota open meeting laws, and that there's been clarity of expectations for communications between you and the board, the board and the superintendent, which is critical for partnership and for moving forward. Some of the concerns, and they were in four key areas, operational oversight, board committee, uh, board members and understanding of practices, and public engagement. And so I don't think that comes as a surprise, but I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you individually, as well as to see um, both the consistency and uniqueness in your feedback. So from the operational oversight, it was language and understanding of the current strategic plan as well as the improvement plans at the school and department level. So I would frame this as coherence, understanding, and clarity of alignment, which goes into the next piece under B, which is clarity and understanding of current goals and performance measures, mass metrics, and results reporting that the board can understand, as well as clarity and coherence that flows from the vision for the district to the metrics of performance, to strategies, improvements, implementation, and monitoring. So it's the complete feedback cycle from the vision of who do we want, what are we striving to be, and then how do we measure that, and then what are we doing in strategies and implementation to get there. So from um, for all the people that couldn't wait to be here tonight, um, from the uh, from a board's perspective, having a, an effective feedback loop from vision through implementation allows you to provide your fundamental role of monitoring and assurance. And so that's why this feedback loop uh, is important. Um, you also dived in, which is probably even a, uh, was a bigger piece in addition to operational oversight, was board committee, uh, what I would say clarity of statements of scope um, and that role, and then linking that to your board through your governance work plan so that your committees which are organized to do the primary work of governance. As you know, uh, boards don't have management committees, they have governance committees. So from your three-year work plan, what are the parameters of each of the board uh, committees? What are the limitations of the board committees? And then what are some effective protocols and practices? Uh, specifically, there's a specific focus on the public engagement and legislative agenda committee. Um, then there also was concerns around board members' understanding and the practices of minimizing surprises, which is important for everyone at the board table. Um, your hope, your biggest surprise is someone being here five seconds late. Um, 
uh, unity of voice after uh, school board action. So uh, for members of the public um, that may not understand what that term means, um, boards and councils operate slightly differently. Boards use Robert's rules in voting to create a district voice which once a vote has been taken that has a majority, it doesn't matter what the majority is, once a majority voice of the board has been um, established, it becomes the voice of the district, and then that is held by boards both privately and publicly. Um, so individual voice is uh, prior to and all the work leading up to a vote, and then after a vote, affirmative vote, then the board operates with a unity of voice. Um, and also understanding clarity about how our agenda sets uh, setting, so how our agendas of the board set, um, how our committee given directions, and how does workflow happen. So if you have a three-year governance work plan and you look at the next year, how does workflow get assigned to committees? How does it come through work sessions to, to board action meetings and thus um, move to either approval or denial, whatever the board and finally, there was in the area of the public engagement, specifically the committee, the scope and limitations of the committee, the processes and the protocols for the board calling for public engagement. So there's, a, there's two different levels, as you're aware of, that the board engages. You create protocols and practices, what I would say, continuous engagement of the public. And then on key issues, decisions, and processes, the board calls for public engagement, which is usually handed over to the superintendent to develop the processes and the protocols of public engagement. And this is for major decisions. So um, where this happens is that when there's large-scale facilities development planning, when there's that fun thing called uh, boundary changes, refinements, um, when things like that happen, the board calls for public engagement and then, um, and then the superintendent and the office of the superintendent um, develops that. Uh, just working with a board where the, uh, a week ago where the board called for a multi-year process that will lead up to a referendum. But it's a multi-year engagement, so they're asking for a proposal for a multi-year engagement. And then um, you also were interested in, as we move in the future, of design options for multiple channels of public engagement. Um, because not everybody engages at a meeting like this. So how does the board engage its stakeholders, uh, citizens of this, of this that live within the geographic area of this district on a continuous basis? So are there any questions on uh, both strengths and concerns as outlined? Report? If not, then we'll keep, um, we'll keep going down. Um, and so what was seen as, um, as some of the key recommendations that, that can occur in, in terms of a development process is to look at developing board committee charge and parameter statements for each of the committees. And I believe we'll take a look at those. Tim. So what we've done is uh, I've worked with, with Jason and the executive committee and we've actually gone through each of the committees and tried to create what I would say are consistent, parallel, and fairly workable charge statements. It, obviously, it's up to the board, but we thought the executive committee felt that in receiving this report, they wanted to come into this work session with work having been done. So we'll take a look at those. Um, development of a detailed governance work plan across your five key roles and um, I'm not sure if that there will be time for to do to dive into that today, but what we have done is taken a look at some past work that the board has done. I've asked, we've asked Jason and his team to take a look at from administration viewpoint, from an administrative management viewpoint, what is governance work that's needed to be done over the next three years. Hopefully, we can bring that together um, for a um, one-page, three-year plan for the board. Um, we're also talking about the development and use of a long-range model in partnership uh, with the Office of the Superintendent. So a long-range model is a key governance tool that looks lo out like in a time frame of 10 years and begins to model all the major assumptions of um, enrollment, revenue, expense, 
fund balance and gives the board a tool um, not to predict, but to reflect based on what happens. Where are things going in the long term? The language that I like to use as an image, it allows you to play chess more than playing checkers all the time. Um, and so that is suggested to be in your development. Um, also, we find it's good to review of an accountability for school board legal obligations. Um, and I know that who you uh, use for legal counsel, but just for your information, sometimes we do take team board development sessions from a legal and a governance, actually a lot of fun. So boards can ask questions on and get the legal, from a legal perspective, here's what a board needs to know. From good governance practice, here's what a board might want to uh, think about. Um, and with the exception of one issue, we align on everything. So it's, uh, it's been, that has worked real well. We also talked about a suggestion of coaching of the board executive committee, because as you know, as a board, you elect officers to sit on an executive committee. And um, as, as a board that has quorum activated authority, that means your authority to take action is only when you're in quorum. So in quorum, you vote for officers and you provide them rights to act outside of quorum to do work on behalf of the board. So an executive committee, how it functions and how it functions in partnership with the superintendent actually is a key to success for most school boards. And so we've had some discussion um, about that. Um, also to look at a district school board handbook. Um, it's, I know that we've chatted about this. What is governance is a big mystery in the public. Sometimes it's a mystery um, for board members. There's a lot of training that goes on. Um, but what we've found to be an effective tool is for a, a district to have a public document about what is governance. Um, how, does a, how does someone get on the board? What are the responsibilities of a board? What are the limitations of being on a board? And, there, um, and I've provided, uh, I think, linkages to you of, I think, three two or three different right. board mm -hmm. handbooks that in our estimation are really well done. And the um, suggestion is that you could take a look, um, take a look at that about creating one for yourselves. Um, and then also our suggestion is, and I know that we've gone through some of this, so under G, is that there's some simple tools that a school board and a superintendent can use. Um, many of these are um, during meetings for reporting, for discussion that really help reinforce the differences and the value of excellence in governance and excellence in management. I think we're, we've gone through the T-chart at times in discussions, right? We've gone through that. Um, guiding change documents, uh, dealing with issues and opportunities in the public square. I know, I know public square, there's nothing going on. But We've done this um, dealing with issues like COVID, masks, CRT, uh, with school districts about how to deal with issues in the public square for a board, um, rather than um, trying uh, with some of the things that have been happening. Um, also about managing trust and mistrust partnership and isolation that um, comes up in school boards. Because when you deal around this table and all your interested citizens are here to listen to you, and provide input, it does create tension and relational issues. So one of the um, options I offered, uh, I think to the whole board in the past, but we talked about at the executive committee, um, we, we've had a district that has up to over 20 years, every spring the board does spring cleaning. Every year the board looks back at all the meetings and the interactions between themselves and with administration. And they kind of clean the air as to things that have happened that have led to isolation and mistrust, things that have led to partnership and, and working in concert with each other. And then they reach an agreement about what they're going to try to do more of and less of to constantly refresh that relationship. And then public and staff engagement strategies. And we've talked about, but we'll talk more about um, an IAP2 it's a public engagement framework. It's an international framework. Um, literally 90% of the districts we work with use IAP2, both down and in. 
to the schools and up and out to the board. So that was um, a number of um, items for excellence in governance. And what we found also in excellence in management was a refinement of the strategic and operational plan in language to increase clarity and coherence for the school board to review and assess district performance measures and metrics for alignment, for clarity, for you and the public, um, to review and assess the design of the executive functions, especially with regards to engagement and communications, to work with the board on developing a long range district model. And finally, um, development and effective use of high quality monitoring reports to the board. Um, so many times when boards are saying, I wish I knew, or I don't quite understand, sometimes, not always, but sometimes the root of it is having a consistent and high quality monitoring report that at least serves as a language between administration and a board. And becomes, uh, it also becomes, the, uh, quite honestly, the data set for assessment of a superintendent. So we looked across both of these, so these are the um, the recommendations, the um, executive committee looked at these and asked that movement on board committee, chart statements, the work plan, the long range model, the handbook uh, begin as soon as possible, as well as work on um, operational planning, performance measures and metrics, and, and D and E under excellence and management. So the immediate response was, let's get moving on this. So again, I'll open it up for questions around governance and management. So I don't know if there are questions or just in general comment. I think yes. it's been good to work with you, uh, Dennis. I think we've had a couple of other engagements this year that have brought some clarity as, I mean, this is so I'm a year and a half into my term. So we've learned, uh, you know, when I joined the board, this board has really good practices for communications mm -hmm. and I think always has in, in good collaborative relationships between the board and the administration, at least that's my experience. But there were also opportunities um, to learn how the cadence can be more predictable and uh, more transparent, both for members of the board and I think also for members of the public. We saw that in different experiences over the past year, whether it's school closures or mask uh, mandates or I, I'm assuming even now with uh, some of the budget um, issues that are, right. I'm sure, eager to be spoken about yet later this evening. But um, that's that was always the goal. And I think what, you know, what the, the conversation, the research that you've done, um, and I think these steps forward, these next right. steps forward will help. Again, I guess it's not about redesigning or doing something because there was this huge opportunity to completely change things, but there are opportunities to strengthen our, our processes and that's what yeah. this is all about. So thank you. Yeah, if you look at it, a lot of this is clarity and refinement. You had a structure, mm -hmm. we need to clarify it. You have a district strategic plan, can we clarify it? You have measures, can we clarify how we report? So there's a lot of can we clarify, can we strengthen? Ultimately, will be more effective. Right. Well, I would offer you this. Uh, your structure, your protocols, and your practices in writing is what actually creates a bit of a both strength and safety net to deal with all of the issues that school boards and administrations are dealing with. And if you don't have the strength of the structure, the practices, and the protocols in writing, then you have a tendency to deal with things based upon personality and interpretation of what's going on. Yep. So this is not only should strengthen the board for administration and your partnership with each other, my hope is it also strengthens the district in terms of how it needs to do its work um, out over the next couple of years. And as you know, as boards and new members of a board come on a board, they come into a structure. So if the structure is set, it's much better off, mm -hmm. right? And you've been engaging in this structural work for four years, five years? Yep. It's, it's really, Mr. Chair, it's really nice to see all this kind of laid out. I mean, it's some of the stuff we were doing, a lot of what we were doing, but to have it more explicitly laid uh -huh. out and where we can kind of tweak those nuances, right. it's good to see that and have it all set together mm -hmm. for everyone. So I don't know if you want to pop up the... Executive. Which one do you want to start with? 
Did you want to use my glasses? No, I'm good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that was a bad idea. I'm sorry. I just want to let you know the. You uh, definitely don't want to use my room glasses. At the, the district office, uh, the conference room, I had it all set up. <laughs> it was really. Well, that means we'll have to unset it up. The, uh, your, your, your kind custodian said, What are you here for? I said, How oh, <laughs> The executive committee. When I said, I'm, well, I'm here for the board meeting, I got this look, what? Okay, I'll let you in, but I'll come back and check on you. <laughs> That's awesome. So you can take a, um, take a look at this. So what we did is we have a consistent form, which you've seen before, about purpose and membership and authority. Um, and I'll just, I don't know if you've seen these, so I don't know what the board... Yeah, we, so after our last meeting, Dennis, we did, I mean, uh, the executive committee and Jason, you know, we we had some back and forth and then we shared them about a week and a half ago, I think, with okay, the rest so of the board. Okay, so you have a chance to look at these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Perfect. I know Steve studied it in close detail. <laughs> One of them I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what we'll, uh, you, what you're going to see is, is hopefully some consistency and parallelism. Um, so while we just look at the executive committee and rather than read things to you, um, uh, feedback or questions that board members have on the executive committee charge and parameter. Just one question. Did we add that part about board chair and vice chair do not serve on other committees, I think? So that's... Because I like that and I can't I know it was a big discussion that we had about that and it, it made, to me, it still makes sense mm -hmm. to do it that way, but I wasn't sure if we added that after the fact to this document. So I don't think we had a document like this. Um, this okay. is a new draft that's being passed on for the first time. So yes, it's in the first draft, but we didn't have a pre-existing document. Okay. But but to answer that question, you know, I having, think it was practice, though. Yeah, it was practice. It was it was preferred practice. And when we did create these committees, when we originally created this whole piece three years ago, right. four years ago, this was the operating idea of what the executive executive committee would do. It's all laid out here and. It was practice that the chair and vice chair would not serve on committees. Right. It was just kind of an operating thing that we did, but it wasn't explicitly laid out. So. But it defaulted. I remember a couple yeah. of times when people didn't select, mm -hmm. it should go back to the chair and vice chairs. And that's what happened this year to have a conversation of, okay, board members, we need to have somebody fill this role, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, no, so, okay. so what happens with boards is when you have a lot, especially when a board has a lot of management committees, then everybody gets assigned to multiple because you have 10 plus committees. When you move into excellence and governance, in this case, you have four governing committees, and typically executive committee members stay on executive committee, and the other three to four committees are staffed by the other board members. That way it allows other board members opportunities to serve, um, and it also allows the um, it allows when the chair and the vice chair are managing meetings, they are not giving and receiving their own reports from committees. They sit on, they receive reports from their fellow board members on those committees. Sure. So, so right now the current practice is we, I don't sit on any other committees now, but Hannah I does do. sit on right. the community engagement committee. Right. So are we adopting the, I think the question will be if we're adopting this formally, then we would reassign your position, so it probably deserves a little discussion. Yeah, and I would say the reason, I think when we had committee assignments this year, we agreed that that is best practice, but given our situation, um, we didn't have, because we have three other committees and between the board members, we didn't have the uh, ability to have uh, that commitment right. for board members to commit to two per person. And so mm -hmm. at that time, um, I volunteered to continue serving on the Community Engagement Committee, which we started last year. And as part of this work, I think really just started scratching the surface of what I had hoped to get into last year. And so I'm happy to continue. And I think we can adapt the policy so that it doesn't have the statement, but that we accept that it's typical practice. I don't wanna go against a written document that we have in, in the event we have a board member who needs to leave and we the work still needs to be done. My so. recommendation is that you could leave it in there, but maybe make the language a little lighter in terms of like, uh, I don't know how to say the words right now. Um, typically, not. typically do not serve on yeah. other committees. That's correct. Right or something, but mm -hmm. extenuating circumstances can arise or something about a little bit of yep. flexibility, something like that where it's uh, written yeah. and preferred, but things happen and you have to figure Keep out what to do. Keep the going. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, you said, if you just said typically do not serve, mm -hmm. um, 
but it's, it's always up to the board how it wants yeah. to make those assignments. I don't really want to know what you're... Oh. Yeah, otherwise I'll forget it. <laughs> no, typically yeah. what do Typically want, board, yeah. do not serve... Put the board chair in that chair. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm there always is... You're right. When if you do, if a board member leaves and you don't have a board member, but you want a committee to to continue functioning, then you may say yes, we'll assign to in order to cover, because you don't want a committee to say, well, we don't have enough members to operate. You want those to continue. Any other questions on executive? No, I think this one looked pretty good. Yeah. All right. It's nice to see it all right now. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see I'll it all right it. now. Next, go ahead. Pick any. Well, but how there's about, there's only three, so we'll do another, another easy one. one. <laughs> Want to do policy committee? Yes. <laughs> Low hanging fruit. Yeah, this one's very straightforward, I think. And I mean, you can see even from our work, there was no real changes or questions there about wasn't. it. There yep. wasn't. Yeah, this is one that you had. It had pretty well. And you can see this is also lines up with your governance through your work plan and what you list out. You typically list out what parts of the policy manual are you reviewing per year, and then you always have what new ones are needed, what revisions are made. Um, and, though, and then you can see that you can, um, we have them on all of these, that the board may assign the committee specific projects because committees don't, I'm just gonna make this comment, committees don't operate independently of the board as a whole. They operate at the direction of the board. So the three-year operational plan is a document of direction in some respect, but things may occur where the board may say, wait a minute, or Jason, you may come to the board and say an issue has arose, and I think we need some policy work. And so the board can say, Would, we'd like to assign that to the policy committee, and it's probably gonna need some extra work. I mean, in real terms, that hap that's what typically happens. Okay, any questions? Good. I'm good. Do you want yep. to go to community engagement? <laughs> You're just wondering which committee do I get to be on? All of them. Or please don't assign me to the committee. <laughs> so community engagement. So we'll just start. So one of the comments that um, Kyle had put in there is that he'd like to strike the legislator from the title. So I just I made that. No. Change. Yeah, and that was, you know, the conversation there is there's outputs from that group and, you know, we don't necessarily view a lobbying agenda for the district. Some districts do, but that feels like an output of this more than a purpose of mm. this conversation. And they become almost, is it a legislative committee or is it a public engagement committee? And this feels like it, but wanted to provide more focus mm -hmm. um, on the, I think, the intent, right? Yeah. Yeah, and here's an example where, uh, the, the board can choose to do its work in what would be called the committee of the whole. So there's an example you can say, if we have a legislative agenda or an issue we want to, we can do it as a whole body, not sub delegate it to, for research work by a committee. Yep. And we did one of the changes that I proposed making to this, uh, to this document was adding the word advocacy because one of the things that we talked about last year was how do we further engage our community in understanding and shaping our legislative priorities and then how to um, position them to be advocates and support the efforts that we're doing with the legislative bodies. Um, so while we took legislative out of the title, um, adding in advocacy issues of education, advocacy, public need, thought that that would still yeah, which clarify. Is less product coming out, but more actions within. It's there. It is there? It's yeah, it is there. It's, oh, it's in the highlighted in three. Okay, I'm trying to, to ding these off as we go, so. Okay, oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then I, um, so, I just kind of dive in because I think it's easier to delete things we don't want than to try and wordsmith while we're working, so. <laughs> I, um, one of the things that I added in was step number three, because between two and four, it seemed like we were missing a step between established priorities and recommend strategies to enhance community engagement. 
um, and then review and provide feedback to the administration. So um, something that we've regularly talked about is what is the framework we're going to use and what is the process that we buy as a board call for community engagement around issue specific needs outside of that continuous engagement. So this was something that I proposed adding in. Can I press you? What could that look like? Just, just spitballing a little bit. Yeah, so this is very easy to answer. Um, where we were going last year was using the same framework that Dennis suggested. And I think what's important to understand about the community engagement and when you call for community engagement, there's two things that Dennis, Dennis highlighted. One is how do we as a board want to build ways to continuously engage with the community? But the second is when there's issue specific um, needs to engage the community around, community can mean different things. And so community might be your educators and your band directors. It might be your um, taxpayers. It might be your students. It might be um, you know a, a variety of people. So community doesn't always mean the public at large, but that's something that this committee can bring recommendations to the board to say, um, how would we determine that? How would we call for community engagement so that we can then make that ask of the of the administration to develop ideas for how that looks. An example would be the what what we really like about this IAP P we call IAP two framework is that it crystallizes or at least aligns language that you use about engagement with promise of experience or use of feedback with types of processes that uh, a district would use, and that framework is. School districts use it, public entities use it, private entities use it for, for both down into the organization with employees, but also um, out in the public. And I'll just offer for you, when you have a framework and process and the public says, oh, when, I, when you say this word, you're promising this type of engagement. When you say this word, you're promising this type of engagement. And it doesn't take long before the public and staff begin to understand and there's this consistency and that limits dissonance and misunderstanding. And you might remember at one thing, I brought a bunch of printouts. That was one of the things that I handed out at that special meeting and Jason, we have it saved in a folder if, you, yep. if people wanna see it, what that spectrum is and what that looks like. But it has the public participation goal, the promise to the public. Mm -hmm. Um, example techniques so that you can kind of see what the different ways uh, that that might manifest so yeah and I think the I'm sorry if I add to this but I think the other key here too is that number four is all about after decisions been made and sometimes there are opportunities and really requirements that we are gathering feedback and providing insight before the decision is made so I think it's it's a little bit of yeah, just ensuring there's that two-way communication and transparency continue to enhance that throughout. Fair enough. Yep. I didn't just well, say what you said over again, did I? No. So you probably, um, you probably, based on what you said earlier, you probably could take seven off of this. Because that speaks to a legislative agenda and you've taken it out of your title. I, I'm just... I think we still want to, oh. I think we just want to be more intentional, at least that was our discussion last year, was instead of kind of checking a box, um, and, our, and our administrators were doing a great job of tracking bills and identifying priorities, mm -hmm. is there a way that we can do this in a more meaningful way? Can we involve community members in helping identify what those priorities are, helping inform them of the bills related to things that are important to them, and then Again, that advocacy. How do we how do we turn this passion for for something into action ultimately? So I, I'd be in favor of keeping it because it's still an output. I think that we would want this group to to consider and to be proactive on, um, just in a just in a little different way. I agree that it should still be there because you have listed for advocacy. My idea, though, it might take a lot of change, would be to have a separate section under advocacy versus having it in the whole bit. I don't know. Because it kind of gets, it does, like what Dennis was saying, is it kind of looks like it's out of place there. Mm -hmm. you're, asking, you do, you're asking for headers. You've got nine items here, so headers. Or something, or maybe them. just like under, you know, regarding advocacy, well, this is a possible way. It could be with, with what you yeah, have for. One, yeah, one know. way you could do is organ, and Jason's going, geez. <laughs> But you, but you could come right back now. and you could organize this <laughs> around uh, <laughs> protocols, protocols and processes. Mm -hmm. 
around advocacy and you could say, and public engagement. I mean, you could do like, so the, the, the committee w would have the would have functions of, uh, for the board of researching, defining um, the, the protocols and practices. Then you have the engagement, which would include the feedback and the after action review. Because I, yeah. could see, I could see that something like looking in terms of like, do we have, isn't there a thing of like how often they meet? Or is it on here? Because you could have a piece that would say that in November or October of each upcoming legislative year, the board, would, the committee mm -hmm. would review upcoming issues in alignment with MSBA and AMSD's yeah, legislative page. platforms. Something mm -hmm. as general as that, and if there's anything there specific to what our district wants to advocate for, whether that's, you know, I can't think of the top of my head. Special but, education know, funding. Is there fully, specific yep. to our the district that we want to advocate for that per, perhaps Jason has testified for, if there's something coming up that's mm -hmm. specifically important to us, like the seat time requirement piece, that we'd be able to be aware of it. Okay. And I would just say maybe October, November, reviewing and what, those. And platforms. all this has here is you meet from time to time. For, so this one, we, we kept more, not vague, but we just more open mm -hmm. than others. Yeah. yeah. I think we can, I, we can probably send this to that committee for that next round of work. But I mean, you can organize this as planning, we execution, could organize, and yeah. reporting. Mm -hmm. Right. And then those bullets can fit under each one of those headers and sort of shows actual work, planning work, reporting work. Because I feel as an like we've had this committee, I know it's been spinning wheels for a while, and I think if we do mm -hmm. not have a specific, we're going to review the upcoming legislative agenda and how it applies to us yeah. and how it works with the member groups that we're involved with, it's not going to happen. Yep. We've right. wanted to, and it just hasn't. hasn't. So we, I think mm -hmm. if we're going to, if we still want to keep that advocacy piece, which is important, a very important part of our job, we need to have it spelled out clear, mm -hmm. or it's not going to happen. It'll be an afterthought. Yep. And I think well, building on that, then we could probably, one of the other additions I made was number eight. So we had talked about how we're, how this, how we as a board and then this committee in particular is looking for ways to build and leverage relationships with our community partners so that it's not in a reactive way, but more in a proactive way so that we're mm -hmm. continuously telling our story, hearing from our community members. But I think um, between seven and eight, these probably both fit mm -hmm. under um, number two, which is establish priorities and recommend strategies to the full board. And so we can I we can it, make yeah, it a little, be, more a little more organized. Concise. The nine would become three, would then become under, also understandable yep. to others. So I think we could okay. take I'm out. following the, Jason, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. and I'd be more than we have to throw in. <laughs> and and again, I'm gonna, for the linkage, the. The policy committee has, has a line across a three-year governance work plan. The public engagement committee also has like a dedicated line. It's a nice way of adding in these things mm -hmm. so that then they appear as a charge to the committee. And then it's, okay, so how do you want to organize your meetings? When are you going to do X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. And I think that will, uh, what you talked about, creates a predict, predictable, I don't know if I said drumbeat, mm -hmm. but oh, we're going to do this sort of cycling through. Okay. And just broadly speaking, because I think there was, this was a, a key committee last year where there was a lot of discussion around what does the how look like or the management piece of this versus the oversight piece. And so one of the things that Kyle and I had started with the, our administrative partners on was just trying to get a baseline of what are the current ways we do engage the community in ongoing ways through. and through surveys, and again, community isn't just our broad community, but our educators, our students, um, are there gaps? What do we, you know, what are we learning from those? Um, and so back to what Dennis said about the continuous ways, this is something that we as a board have talked about, you know, do we wanna start doing listening sessions outside of just the public comment mm -hmm. at meetings? Are there other strategies that we want to start or consider um, in, or joining, you know, PTP meetings for 15 minutes and sharing updates. Are there other strategies that this committee might recommend or bring to the full board of things that we could be doing differently or more effectively to to further our partnership with the community and parents? But once again, it's important to highlight that that's, that committee only has the purview of what the board as a whole right. recommends and approves. So Right, and this is based on assignment. So again, yep. if it's going to that committee to say, what are the ways that we can, we've heard that we need to improve our communication with parents. We've heard um, that people want more opportunities outside of the board meetings to give their feedback. 
assign this committee, please come to the full board with your ideas and recommendations for how we as a board might do that. And just for everyone that, that, that might be listening, um, in all of these, you'll see that the, the, the committees have no um, independent expressed authority to decide anything. They do research recommendations in partnership with assigned executives, administrators, in order to develop recommendations for basically for a board work session like this to consider taking to action. And I just want to clarify that because I think sometimes we start, you know, we start getting a little prescriptive about what the committee is going to do. It starts catering that to giving them more authority and that's not the intent. It's more having the structure of what to do, but depending on who's sitting at the table and how it's interpreted right. and well, given. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, the and the, I think the clarity of writing this down in a parallel form will, will help both you as a board and also help future boards because mm -hmm. they'll come into the structure in the future, which yeah. is. And I think Dennis made an important clarification about public engagement is a key responsibility of the board in addition to these other key responsibilities that we have. And so there, this is the one that feels a little unique because we are talking about how to do that as a right. board and versus if we're calling for community engagement on an issue like boundaries or start times, that's up to the administration to figure out the best way to go about that, mm -hmm. the how. So, yeah. so this committee is just a little unique in that way because- yeah. Community engagement that you yourself will engage in will be more have more how to it than the community engagement that you call for in which you're asking the mm -hmm. superintendent to develop the how. Right. That's fair. I think mm -hmm. one of the values, and I'm glad you put it in here, was like PTPs in the in the booster clubs. Uh -huh. In the past, yeah. we would have representation at some of those, and the value that it brought was a better understanding of the different policies that we did have or we lack thereof, mm -hmm. um, what concerns they had in the district that we could bring back and stuff. So I, I think those are two heavy hitters within the district we need to be, this group mm -hmm. yeah. needs to Absolutely. Be, mm -hmm. be engaged in. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a good call out on that. Okay. Do you want to go to the next no, committee? Um, have we drained we this committee? Can we touch, touch sure. base uh, quickly on the membership piece of that? So this is one item for discussion is um, as far as how many administrative partners we want to have on this. So for each committee, we have two board members. Some have one designated administrator or two. Um, in this case, we have three. And in my experience last year, three felt like a lot. It felt like a lot of time pulled away. Um, and it's a lot of time pulled away, but it's also hard to work orchestrate some of those schedules sometimes, right? Right, from a scheduling standpoint. And so I wondered if it might be more efficient to identify one or possibly two partners and then pull others in as needed. Because again, depending on the community engagement, it could be even beyond those that have been identified, right? So um, I think just from mm -hmm. a, a planning meeting, it's, it, it's also a little easier to have kind of a go-to um, that you're able to build that relationship with who really gets to know the work in and out and i think it reduces opportunities for confusion around what are we doing and you think you think it means this and and so i think we we could improve in that area what would your recommendation be then um i i would say we don't need three i would recommend one or if 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 we need two if that would be beneficial that we could do that but um I, I definitely don't think we need three administrators. As Jason, what's your point of view? Two administrators paired with two board members and all the other ones, so I think two, yeah. that would be that would make sense to me. Mm -hmm. and I think yeah. one of the things that we did when we spun up this committee again was to try to get kind of our three learning directors involved in that. And um, so, I mean, that, you know, swing and miss a little bit, but I do think two would make sense. Oh, it's not a miss. Stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, it, you're right, you add additional people and um, it makes it more difficult, but so. So which one do you, or who would you recommend or? I, 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 we'll talk about that. I think uh, okay. Andrew's yeah. in the back. Um, you know, we are uniquely organized because we don't have a director of communications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, unlike a lot of places. Yeah, and, that's... and Andrew um, has been, he's skilled in that area, even though he's the director of instructional technology and he does work with our communication general, so I would for sure say him, and then um, we'll probably Lisa and Chris will flip over it. We'll see. <laughs> so we'll talk, we'll figure that out more tomorrow. For sure, Andrew, and then we'll put this aside. Short well, straws, is that what you're saying? I thought they were gonna flip right now, just joke. <laughs> and I think even having the clarification that we do now will be, uh, 
a tremendous difference from where we kind of started last year. So of course, um, if there are issues that are broadly reaching the district, we would absolutely want both Chris and Lisa well, and, and, and anyone and, who's and, impacted, and, right? You know, we, we, and most certainly, right? And I think to the point, right, there's, and you said this, that, you know, when needed, we will pull other people. Right. right. Mm -hmm. You know, when the board is having a discussion around, um, you know, our insurance rates, mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we needed to have that conversation. I, I jumped in on that as part of that. So, yeah, so we right. need, we'll get the right people yep. yep. that yeah. need to be there. So. Yep. Sounds good. That was it for okay. that one. So last but not least, the Long Range Planning and Finance Committee. Negotiations. Yeah, so I think that is sort of the open-ended question, right? So that's, it's a good way to bring that. There's sort of a side conversation, you know, with the board too, and this is a good time to have that discussion. Um, the board had two representatives on the labor negotiation committee uh, with the teacher's contract this past year, and I think it was helpful, um, particularly uh, the state of where we're at um, to have that presence, and I think there was a little there's a little confusion on the board as to what the intent was uh, when that discussion was made, I think back in February, when uh, Hannah and I were newly minted board members. Um, so was it a conversation, the question became, was it a conversation about only being involved in the teachers union negotiation or was it a broader conversation about board participation and engagement with all uh, bargaining unit um, contracts and you know I went back and there's a couple of conversations we've had on tape I actually missed a meeting in May where so I was like why don't I remember this conversation was because I wasn't there and so I'm reading them I'm listening to the, the conversation and the context is that whatever decision had been made prior I'm gonna guess it was in a closed session so it's not readily accessible to me um, that the intent was that there would be participation on all labor negotiation um, proceedings, right? And I don't think we need to dive into the details, um, but that's I think that's something we need to settle out. And one way we could settle that out is to add a line to this committee that the individuals on this committee be the assigned, we could take it lots of different directions, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but I wanted to, I think we had to have to have a quick confirmation that that's a direction we want for the board. I know Steve, you have some thoughts. Yeah, on since I served on that committee, the value that it brought sitting across the table um, during negotiation was huge. I mean, I've been on, I think, three negotiations, and to see it in place, I don't know, 16 meetings or whatever we went to, to understand the size of it, the communication part, or the miscommunication part, then it goes out to the other side, is very beneficial, I think, for a board member to understand and hear, um, because when the rumor mill starts going, at least we can clarify it that we were at the meeting that is not what the board said and stuff like that instead of it coming from the admin side of the business. The other part of it is I think that if it is requested from another bargaining unit that somebody be there on behalf of the board, that that would be up to that bargaining unit. I wouldn't say that, um, I believe the question was asked, well, if we do it for the teachers, we have to do it for everybody. And I said, absolutely, but at the request of that bargaining unit on that, we wouldn't just show up. So, so that's how I envision that at that time. And as we continue, I think it's, it's a strong consistency of, uh, of teamwork showing that we are here to listen, that we do have time. Because I hear consistently, why isn't the board members at the table? Um, previous, we had it, then we pulled it. That was at our discretion on that. It wasn't the administration's discretion on that. Um, I found it very beneficial to come back and have that conversation with, with my peers on it. I thought your input and Jacqueline's input was very important during closed session discussions and getting your feedback on, you know, the, the last time you met and we're sitting at the table as well. I thought that was beneficial for me to get another perspective on what was happening. I guess my question is looking at just the press precedence because the board has gone back and forth with mm -hmm. us. I'm also looking at just kind of the precedence going before in the future. We have board members that have the time and the flexibility and the desire to be involved. 
but I don't know if there'll always be that consistency above board members that will be able to make that time for that commitment. So I think that's something to think about if we want to put that into writing and policy, to so to speak, when the members of this table might change and then the availability might be different. Um, the other piece is, you know, with all the different negotiation committees, that's a huge commitment for a couple mm -hmm. board members. And I look at, um, I, I was trying to think about the discussion we had before too, and I believe it was, let's start with teachers and go from there and see what we need to do. Um, I also consider the percentage of the budget that the teachers negotiations are compared to the others. Not that that is any, any, any insignificance by any means, but just in terms of the more of the necessity of wanting them on that one, depending on the others. So I, there's just, I'm just, I'm not really have a strong opinion either way. I'm just kind of throwing out some things to think about before we kind of put this in writing. And that's fair. So here's my personal view. When I signed up to be on the board, the whatever, I knew my commitment would be there. So regardless, it is my job to find the time. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, because we went through, and again, I should know the number, 16 meetings, however, 15, 12, <laughs> I don't remember how many it was. But that was my commitment for, for sitting at this table. Um, secondly, I, I think that regardless of how many is in a union, if it was two people in the union, and they want to sit across from me as a board member, absolutely, even if it's a non-union just to show we, we are engaged, we're going to listen to you. That's no different than the public coming to a meeting and wanting to sit across the table. But again, that's my, that's my perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I also look into it having serving on the 917 board. Mm -hmm. We have a personnel committee, and we also do interspace bargaining. We talked about that before. And so with that, within that board structure, is there are designated board members that serve on the personnel committee, and they also include administrative members as well because we know the long haul for that committee because interest-based bargaining does take a lot more time um so that's just so there's other perspective to throw out of a way that it could be looked at i'm not saying we want to add committees but knowing if there is desire to have board members consistently within negotiations i think it might need to be separate since then finance even though it does have a long-term finance piece to it absolutely because you need to have that longevity you know the here and now and what that's going to do in the future but in, for, in terms of just time of commitment board members, it might be worth considering looking at it that way. Just so throwing you, out options here. Just want to make know. sure I hear you correctly. Mm -hmm. You're asking, right. instead of amending it to this committee, creating another charter for a negotiations committee, for example. That I think could, that's a reasonable That could be to. an option. Just throwing out options. I will tell you one thing that I would struggle with coming out of the negotiations. We, it was nice to have a conversation with Jane and Mary Ann and Chris, at that time, from a financial standpoint, being on the finance committee. Sure, absolutely. Because if you ask me to explain that in layman's term a week from now to everybody, I couldn't do it. I'll be, I'll be frank about it. Mm -hmm. That's why I turned to the expert on that. Um, but again, when it comes to the time part, if, if my expectation is for our HR director and finance director to be there representing for an hour, two hours, three hours, I would hope that a board member would be willing to do that alongside of it. So that's, fair. that's all. Just options to consider. Yep. I don't know if it needs to be decided tonight, right. but just throwing out other ways to possibly look at it. Just for context sake for the board, and Melissa and Steve might remember this mm -hmm. too. So um, one of the reasons from the shift from being having board members as part of negotiations came out of work with them. That's yep. true. So yeah, I, I know. It was my fault. Um, I, 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 I'm well, sitting here. Yep, yep. No, no, and I knew that would come up too, right? Yep. And, and go mm -hmm. ahead, Dennis. You can well, speak. Just, uh, so, because you, because we're asked, what what are consistent practices, right? And so our role is to provide you consistent practices. Not saying that there is a rule, but consistent practices is that the board as a whole creates a guiding change document um, around negotiations, right? Um, Typically, you don't have a negotiation committee. It's easier to have as part of the finance and planning because of the integrated nature. The issue that we see, that we where we see uh, practices getting in uh, boards and districts into tr more trouble than you want, uh, what we see is, is when, when board members get involved in the negotiations, which we see as a difference versus observing. When a board member is observing negotiations going on, you listen, you learn, and you're able to report back. We, we, we find that that works quite well. 
That, where, was, that we, was sort of how you approached it, right, Steve? You were well, more observers than actually ab And I think that's the difference. I, yeah. I, I know where you're going with it, and that's what exactly kind of what I wanted to hear, right. but yes, go ahead. I, There's a difference when the board member versus HR director or attorney or is negotiating. Correct. Right, that's where we find the issue arises. So we get asked a lot of time, why can't we be there? So board members, as assigned by the board, observing, listening, and reporting back as an extra set of ears is very valuable for board members, even for administrative team members. Did we all hear the same thing? It's the act of the board members negotiating when it's going to come back to you to vote on. And the issue is, are you objective if you've been negotiating? Versus you can listen and just say, I observed a lot of things going on. It's easier to walk in when it comes time to vote to say, I can be objective and neutral because I was not engaged in the, in the act. I was observing. So I, I, I do believe that we've seen that work uh, well. And I would agree, actually, uh, that as a listener, if if a, if a bargaining group says we don't we don't need you there, there's not an obligation. But if even, as you said, even if it's two people in a group and they say we would like a board member to listen, then I think if you do it with one, you should be open to providing that for all. Because mm -hmm. yep. yeah. then you're consistent for all groups. But it's about listening versus engaging. That's the that's the main issue. Mm. And the guiding change document just says as you which is actually from the board to administration about what are the key parameters that right. we want to operate with it. Um, so I think that works really well. And then what the board could do is you, you as, a, as members of a committee, you could make decisions about who's going to listen and observe in what negotiations every other year. And if you have a whole lot of them, you could request what other board members assist. But I think if you're on finance and long range, you have a different view of the whole package that you're really talking about than if I was quote unquote on policy. And I haven't been in those other meetings, so I don't have the depth of knowledge. That's why mm -hmm. typically those members are asked to um, listen during negotiations. And that's how we did it, but I, I think we do need that specific document so we can always refer back to that. And, yeah. and there's no gray area. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marianne did a very, Good job explaining what our role was going into that um, at the time. So, I, I, but I mean, having that document mm -hmm. to pass on to the next um, board members, I think, would be very, very beneficial. And, on that. and I think if you if you describe what you're saying, yes, we agree. If that's I think if that's described in the committee charge, then it's clear to you and everyone else. Oh, that's why we're here. So I just tapped in a sixth item here. So support negotiations with bargaining units by listening, observing, and reporting back on proceedings for advice to the board. Yeah. Is that simple, clear mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. that provides yeah. that yeah. Yeah. commitment? Yeah. It's, kind of, it's really no different than, than how we sat at the closed session where Marianne and Jane presented and stuff, and then they would ask, do you guys have anything else to add? I mean, it's pretty much what we did this past year. Great. I think the one thing that I'd like us to consider or discuss <clears> is that Whenever we're implementing a change, I like to think about how we're evaluating if the change is having the intended effect. So we, we have our experience as a board in hearing that this was valuable. I'd like to have an understanding of how we um, assessed if the teachers found it valuable. Did they find it to be a positive okay. experience? Because while we're offering to do it for all, is this at request, but also if they'd rather us not be there, will we respect and honor that? So I think how we um, you know, consider or get that type of feedback is something that we could discuss yeah, I or... I suppose the tension there is at their request or what if it's the board's prerogative, right? Well, so I'll be honest, here, here's gonna be the caveat out of that, and I'll That's be frank good. about it, is you're gonna have teachers that would love it, and you may have that bargaining unit that do not. But so, I think that goes back to the continuous engagement or the the strategies that we as a board want, right? Like if correct. we establish regular listening sessions with educators that are open, yep. then we're building ways that we're hearing from them more regularly instead of just around this one issue, right? So mm -hmm. I see a lot of these as intertwined and good opportunities for us to discuss, not that we have to decide tonight, but just something for consideration. Again, if we're putting it in a document, I. 
Um, I like the way it says support negotiations, but I think that you know if we end up having, um, I like the idea that Melissa proposed. There's a number of ways that this could could look in practice. So and one can way meet you could goals. consider of this for all of your committees is to look at your annual board evaluation for yourself and say, which is typically assigned to the executive committee, um, that when you have a uh, annual board evaluation, how do you evaluate not only your, your outcomes and your plan in your meetings, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of your committees mm -hmm. and their assignments? Right. I like that part though, Hannah. I yeah. think that, that's part. a nice yeah. clean way of looking at all. But you're asking the question, but how do we get a feedback loop on this yep. structure that we've set up? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I think that's really that's important. Good... We talked about that last year too a little bit. How are we holding ourselves to the same um, standards, you know, by which we are evaluating Jason or, and just continuously looking for our own strengths and opportunities to get better? And this is a good example of. Is there a need to add a point right. in here then, or is that something that the uh, that this group will take back and massage and bring back to the board later? I think it's something we need to add in there. I think, you know, that, that's a critical part of it. I mean, we're, we're evaluating mm -hmm. everybody else, but we're not being evaluated. Is that in the executive committee? There was a bullet in the executive committee. Yeah, yeah that's the evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. There there conducts I, the annual school board evaluation. I snuck mm -hmm. it in there. Yeah, it was number seven. Okay. Yep, perfect. And and that and th so that should show up on your three-year governance work plan that every year you have an evalu mm -hmm. annual evaluation process for you as well as for your superintendent as chief executive. Well, I have one more question. Then when we talk about contract negotiations and being under the committee and stuff, maybe it doesn't fall under that. That, that guiding change document, is that a document that we would use on every negotiation? Saying here's kind of like a checklist. Yeah, I think it would help to see an example of that. Can you provide like a de-identified example um, similar to you? I can, we did we with have the handbooks? Some. Okay. So we use it as part of our internal budget parts and okay. stuff like that. So I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would help so, me uh, to your guiding, point, Steve. Like how detailed are these? The really and... goes through the data and the information of why, which with negotiations probably doesn't change much, but it really is the what, what is, what is to be, what is to be provided inside of any agreement, and what is not to be. So the board isn't telling you what the agreement is, what the agreement is, and I say in administration, the agreement has to be this. It says, we want to achieve these aims and we want to avoid these means of getting to that end. And then the agreement is the creative how. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. All right. The only thing left is the um, the operating the the strategic governance plan and I don't know that we intended to go through that in great detail I think I'm we sorry, still I, oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry I, I wondered if before we move on from the Finance Committee if there's one more opportunity to raise a question um, Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thinking back to the Community Engagement Committee and how we outlined um, bringing back ideas to the board one of the things that I think for this committee that could be really beneficial for us as a board and um, and the community too is building some more of that cohesion beyond just the, not just the negotiations um, with our bargaining units, but also things like our budget. So, um, you know, I see here review annual budget assumptions and process and provide recommendations back to re administration. But I also wonder if there's an opportunity there to use this committee to just have a deeper understanding of not just what the assumptions are, but the impact that it will have within our district to our students or staff, like, and bring that back to the board so that, you know, our administrative partners in this finance committee can really articulate to the rest of us and our community, this is what this really means. These are the numbers. This is what it looks like, but this is what we're talking about. And this is important to us because we need to have a deep understanding of it and be able to communicate it well to, to, um, to our community members and those who are most impacted by the budget. And as I've learned in the last year and a half, school financing is so complicated and nuanced. And um, Jane does a great job of making it understandable for us. But I think part of the part of what's helped me is the repetition that I almost always see in a packet or hear at a meeting something about the budget. So I'm getting more and more understanding of it. Whereas our community members, 
um, you know, or he hear or identify pieces kind of year to year in the big thing. So all that to say, I wonder if there's a step that we can add this, add to this that's that translates that somehow about, um, you know, as part of the review and that review process, being able to bring back to the board um, a, an understanding of the impact. Could you do it, could you do it by just saying, uh, review annual budget assumptions, process, and impact? Yeah, something and, like that. Or impacts, mm -hmm. and provide just by adding that. That well, additional. My question is if you want to have it more nuanced, like what you were talking about with the, um, the what was the other one, legislative and thinking engagement, right. how we mm -hmm. talked about how in October we'll look at legislative ideas. Well, the school budget has a night the same cycle every single year. Mm -hmm. right. So maybe we have written in committee on, you know, we'll look at it in November and we'll look at it in February. I don't, I don't know what times would be the most appropriate, like first pass and then once you're looking at whatever the changes are yep. and have that set in stone before it goes back to the right. administration, before mm -hmm. it goes back to the community, that stop gap in between. So, like so, something what it, specific. so would we, so when we work on the, when you work on a three year agenda, one of the values of the three year agenda is you take a look at the next year and usually this falls on the executive committee and the superintendent is to calendar, mm -hmm. but not board work sessions. You calendar committee sessions, mm -hmm. and then you begin to say, the, this is what you're saying, the committee needs to look at this at a flow to bring it to work session, to still be able right. to go to an action meeting. And on a budget, it's not a simple one meeting. Mm -hmm. It goes through a series, right? now. Obviously, in negotiations, you don't know how many meetings, so it's a time frame. But I think some of the things that you're talking about, if you had an annual calendar, you could actually take a look at that. So I'll just offer you this. Some districts actually find it easier to actually roll out a two-year calendar. You're not committed. It's not like in stone, because you're always going to adjust your agenda items. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you'll probably find out that you actually can lay out about 80 85% of your work plan in committee and agenda drafts mm -hmm. and have that. Um, and so it also allows board members to look ahead and say, what, what again are we looking at in June? Oh, in June we're doing this. Oh, these committees are working this month to get us from here to here. It's a nice document for you, your administrative partners, to be on the same page mm -hmm. of flow, of what is the flow. And I'd like to be even more detailed where it's even a three to five year plan saying, okay, we know coming up in this month, in two years, we're gonna have this contract coming due so we can uh, start that, getting prepared. That, that's why they, because you're on a two year contract cycle is why some boards have gone to a two year calendar cycle because they know the two year calendar cycle actually repeats more often than the one year. Mm -hmm. So the two year cycle repeats under contracts, right? Well, then we I, I know. I'm. You were just going. Wait, no, no, I was like, no. how could it repeat more often than the one year? But it's, it's and it, just an example. We've had math times. Is hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> we've had times this year where we've said, wait, why didn't this go through? Like the insurance issue right. a couple times ago. Is like, I think we need to have those visibility on it. We need it yeah. just that, you know, those, that agenda set mm -hmm. on when they'll meet within right. the, the two. I think that's crucial. Because mm -hmm. it and, doesn't happen as, as, often or as valid when it needs to if it's just a we'll meet when we need to meet yeah. mm -hmm. and you'll find that that two-year cycle no. with your with your uh, contracts also is a two-year cycle with with uh, state funding mm -hmm. where you have the on and off cycle so the two yeah. cycles mm -hmm. allows you to see if that's the repeating cycle is actually a two-year cycle for a board than a one-year cycle and we so i had Lori worked on this so we put together a one-year calendar that is mapped out differently than the uh, um, calendar that the board had access to in the past. It kind of laid out the 95% of stuff right. and things mm -hmm. like that. And we laid it out you know, in a framework that goes from committee to work session to board session so you can actually see it better. And mm -hmm. we, can, we can work on dope, putting that into to two years yeah, and then mm -hmm. backfill some of those stuff. And we started mm -hmm. to put some of the things in there that we knew um, when committees typically would want to meet around, mm -hmm. you know, budget stuff around our audit, around <coughs> to our parameters, um, you know, typically we haven't had a lot of discussion around um, our insurance, but if that is something that 
you know, we want to get and have the committee be part of that at some point in time. We can add that to it as well. But we have we have a one year kind of planned out for next year, and we can work on a second year to do a very similar thing. So. And by no means am I faulting what hasn't happened in the past. Oh. I just no, I, I, know, it, or criticizing. It, I just want to say, like, I just think if we're going to be this specific, let's let's put it down. Put everything down. Mm -hmm, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we're not going to go through the other, and I'd, I'd recommend not, um, because it's just another Excel document, and I've seen enough of that in my. And I think we have to. I think the uh, the executive committee a little more needs to sit down and, and, uh, yeah. and refine that some more before we bring it back. So, so I guess the only question I have is: Do the committee members of, particularly the community engagement and the finance and long term planning committee, do you feel like you have what you need to take those next steps? Because that was one of the outcomes we wanted from this meeting, was. To you now to work with Dennis to formalize you know other parts of your charter yeah. start coming back with you know specific recommendations on timing and other um, yeah other work that, yeah the processes that are the work that the board wants uh, to start yeah. getting done this year yeah absolutely good point if, if you desire that I mean, uh, there's a portion of this that you we've are, have already started rolling with mm -hmm. so then what we would work on is coming back to the board as a whole with the timing of a development framing for you that would take a look at all the recommendations in a set of, it's not gonna be a lot, of, but uh, several meetings out over the next number of months in which we hope to pull this together so that you we can complete that development for this, for the board. Great, all right? Thank you, Dennis. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> good discussion. I'll go back to the other room and turn the lights <laughs> on. <laughs> no, no, we're really good with our lighting. Our LED guys, didn't, uh, we're impressed with how well we do our lighting. So they're already off. We're good. So thank you. All right. See ya. Bye, Dennis. So that was a good discussion. I know it's one we've, uh, yeah, it's, well, it's a lot of detail and, and one a good conversation. I think we made good progress. Um, the next item on the agenda Kyle, is- Can I just ask one quick question? So we're talking, just listening to Dennis about having more meetings and this and that. I know our July meeting, we usually have the inner committee or inner whatever you want to call it with, with the, the city. city. With the city council. I personally would rather sit down right now with where we are financially in the district and go through something like this in detail because I think we usually just have one meeting in July. Is that correct, Lori? Sounds right. I would prefer sitting down and doing this again and, and kind of really fine tuning that um, to our needs right now. And, and just to add on to that, we had talked in as, as part of this, um, the board has seen, well, I don't, I don't think the board has seen it. The executive committee has seen kind of a, a I can't remember who I shared it with. So if I share with everybody, um, working on an operational plan to kind of, um, um, bridge the gap between our strategic plan, which is very aspirational to the work that is being done in in our building. Well, from a district wide, our buildings are going to work on those two um, and talking to kind of a, um, a mentor of mine, you know, he suggested that be a good idea to do a retreat and go through that operational plan as part of that retreat, take a half day and sit down, you know, go through that piece. We could, I mean, yeah. maybe that so would be a day to do some of this stuff as well, but we I'm just throwing out there. I, I, I would like us to it's find a idea. time to go through after we get through and we'll talk about strategic planning and we can kind of, you know, revisit what that actually looks like at the end and then how it connects to, um, you know, our operational plan. And, and stuff, ultimately so. our governance plan too that yeah. we'll bring back. So just to throw that yeah. on there as the board's thinking about that. Right. So to be determined. Okay. <laughs> okay. It'd be just be nice to start getting stuff on calendars because we're just about in May and then summer's here and, and everybody's. Yeah, what, I had asked about so. uh, uh, clearing decks and uh, or looking for conflict specifically for that retreat Jason's talking about. Okay. I asked for that in an email a little while ago. So um, I'm sort of assuming most people are either didn't see it or oh, you sent it to free. us yeah uh, it's okay we can okay. follow up <laughs> resend um, it please I will yeah um, so the next item on the agenda is a strategic planning update Jason yeah so um, this this won't take long so I we've we've kind of shared this with the board a couple of different times in Friday notes but it, I, I just want to get some feedback because we're we're working with dr. Gunn to kind of um, organize what May 10th and 11th is gonna look like so just Real quick overview again. So we typically have done a strategic planning update and it's looked different at different times. 
um, with Dr. Cook from the Cambrian Group. Um, we did that um, last September. Um, after that, we um, organized five strategic emergence teams with additional members of our community uh, to, to begin to work on purpose statements. And the idea was to come back in February and work through the rest of that process. Unfortunately, Dr. Cook passed away in December. Um, their, their, their group has some good people, but um, they also have some people that I just wasn't willing to work with. And so we wanted to work, make sure that we worked with, with Dr. Gunn, who's been in our district before. So we had to work on calendars and things like that. So that pushed back things that we would have had done in February now um, to May 10th. As Dennis shared, there's been some conversations around um, the language. Um, I understand it's, it's aspirational and, and may be difficult for you know, people to kind of connect what does it mean, and it's come up in our executive committee meetings and, and some other meetings like that. So um, I kind of threw out three options to the board in, in Friday notes and just want to get some feedback so we can reach back with Dr. Cook to kind of make sure we use that time um, as best we can. So the first option would be just continue forward with the path that we set forward um, and really use that time to review the purpose statements with the strategic emergent team learner, uh, leaders and then kind of take the next steps with that. The, I, I think the second and third option are more what I've gotten some feedback from the board of potentially we're looking for, which would be kind of modifying that strategic plan into more of a strategic framework, uh, more how we use that, specifically looking and, and peeling it back to the strategic intent and then reworking on the language, not simply just wordsmithing it, but actually going backwards, what was the intent of this, and then build it back out. Um, and then we could have the strategic emergence teams then take that work and go back, go take that and then go back to work. The third option is to do is a very similar sort of thing, modify that strategic plan into a strategic framework, looking at that language, um, focusing specific on the strategic intent and then building back out the language to what may be more accessible for, for people. And then take the work that those groups already have done and incorporate pieces of that and that work into our district operational plan. Then we can honor the work that's already been done. If the district group does a good job and honors the intent of the strategic plan, the work that they've done wouldn't be for not. It's still things that could be usable and we could honor that. Um, so really the wording would change, but the strategic intent wouldn't change and we can use those things. Um, we've talked a little bit about it as an admin team and I think if, if the board would like to to spend that time looking at that language and, and kind of peeling back and then moving forward. We would kind of recommend um, option three, where we, we spend that time with Dr. Gunn, look at the, the intent, spend time on that, redo the, and then actually bring in our strategic emergent leaders to kind of share some of the work that they got. And then we can take that as an administrative team and, and you know, use that and i'm not going to say we're going to be able to use all of it it's just we just don't have enough people to do all the things i'm sure that they all the purpose statements they have but um incorporate what we're able to into our district operational plan and then move forward that way so that would be based on the feedback that would be our subject their suggestion but before we start to to mess around with the wording that a couple different teams have put together i just want to make sure the the board is okay with us doing that or if they have other suggestions. I guess my question is I'm having trouble understanding what the difference between the second and third plan. Well, the they, third, so, similar to me. yep, they are. The second plan would, would, would be basically starting the process over of we've re, we've reworded this and now we're gonna hand it back to the strategic emergence team and then ask them to do really their work Same over again <laughs> with oh, different okay. language. They met like three or four times yep. over a couple of months, yep. right? Yeah. Well, probably some of the groups probably met more than three or four times. So, I mean, they, they put yeah. a, a decent amount of time. And yeah. I, I understand the potential um, want to maybe look at the language. I, I do. Um, I, I don't think we want to take a group of people that have volunteered their time and then ask them to kind of redo work on something different. I think we can mold it in there. That's my personal opinion. Well, not knowing anymore because I haven't seen the work from the emergence teams mm -hmm. to, to really understand, I, I'll take your recommendation on that. I think that, I mean, my personal view, and I probably should let other people speak first, but um, <laughs> I, I try to do good at that. Um, my, 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 you know, we've talked about this. I, I, I'm, a, I'm not always good at this myself, but I aspire to speak plainly 
and in words that people understand. And that's the real opportunity. If the strategic intent was right, then the words can follow easily enough. And I think your assumptions about honoring the work that's already been done by the emergence teams should fall into place well enough. And yeah, that's, oh, that's it. Makes just, sense. just knowing the time that is part of the strategic committee from every level, from creating the document to the revisions and piece, I would hate for any of this process to kind of be a slap in the face to what they've done. And so it's how do you work with the planning that's happened, but also have that to understand their intent. And if there needs to be a little wordsmithing, I think that's okay. But I also, I start to cringe a little bit when you talk about wordsmithing, knowing how much the document has has been worked yeah, in mean, the, the process that works. So it's how do you create that, how do you create that summary document that everyone understands the language on all levels without you know changing our incredible plan? Yeah, that's how that's... you have that balance. And it's I, I from having been in the strategic planning committee and from various committees and being a part of it for many years, it's hard to hear, oh, the board wants you to wordsmith it. And I'm not saying that's what you're it, saying, but that's quite how that you but... interpret it sometimes. And so it needs to be very cautious and, with how you look at it. And Dr. Gunn was very clear that he <laughs> wouldn't just sit down with us and wordsmith it. If, if this is the direction the board wanted to do, he would work with the group to peel back to the strategic intent yeah. that drove that aspirational language that is modified over time, um, and then relook at that. But he was not. He had wanted nothing to do with sitting down and spending two days of wordsmithing no. yeah. the current document. No. So. Yeah. My, that's the intent, that's what matters, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point, but um, just to clarify, as far as when Kyle talks plain language, and one of the things that we did here at our September meeting was having our public facing documents that are written in a way that um, all people of our community can easily understand. So typically in my in my profession, anything that's a public facing document goes through a plain language edit so that it's written at an eighth grade language or, or lower so that we're assuming that people have different literacy levels and we're using language that brings everybody along so that everyone knows what our um, values are, or our principles that we're operating under. So just wanna clarify that it's not to change the intent or to wordsmith, but to really help the people in our community, help everyone be able to read our document, know what we believe in, know what we're working towards. Um, and then the second piece, uh, to that is the difference between a strategic plan and a strategic framework. So a strategic plan um, in its traditional sense has goals, strategies, tactics. So what do you wanna do? How are you gonna get there? What are the actions you're going to do? And the problem with traditional strategic planning is that it assumes that the future is predictable and you're kind of trying to chase that. Um, most people look to a strategic plan then and go, well, where are the tangibles? Where are those things that we have through our world's best workforce or through our operational thing plan, the things that are we know are behind the scenes, people want to look at that and see, um, you know, what are our goals around third grade reading or equity or whatever um, as a district we've identified are our priorities and the things that we're working towards. So I've, I have a few examples and I can share them with the board um, that come some of the strategic frameworks that we've been looking to as examples are one or two page documents that are very simple, concise, so you can see what's important to that district. And then the operational plan that Jason's describing is more um, flexible and adaptive to changing circumstances, which, you know, thinking about this in practice three years ago, our strategic plan probably would have went out the window, right? Because COVID hit and it would have all been not relevant to what the circumstances were. So having a strategic framework that outlines the principles that you're operating under and connect your decisions to can be a really valuable tool that you don't have to then update as frequently. And then having your operational plan that can be more adaptive, more flexible year to year, the, the administration can be looking at those tangibles about what's important now. Is it mental health of our students and um, mental health support, work-life balance for our staff? Is it um, our literacy goals? Is it graduation rates? Um, you know, those types of things are the things that we can more easily adapt and update year to year versus constantly um, feeling like, is our strategic plan really reflecting what we're working on right now? And how can we help our community see the connection between all of these things? 
I was just gonna add to that, that the risk of not having something that's plainly understood by everybody reading it is that people don't know what it means and so they don't follow it. And that makes the, that, that undermines the value of the, of the document. So I think all of this is a very valuable conversation and, and work that I think is important for lots of different reasons. And, and, I, and I did share this with the executive team. <clears throat> Part of my, I understand the, the want and the desire to look at this, but part of my, my fear is to lose what has put us in a position to be able to navigate the last two years. And probably mm -hmm. it's been terrible on everybody, but I, I think I look at, um, you know, our, a lot of conversations with people and I, in, in other districts. And sure. um, I, I think it has served us through that. So I think we, sure. we want to make sure we continue to have that aspirational piece, which looks to the future and not only to one that, to, to Hannah's point that we're trying to predict, no, we're trying to create, create. it. What is the future we want to create that we have can, that we are going to take control over and, and not lose that piece. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I yeah, think in talking to Dr. Gunn, I think he believes that it, that we can go through that process and, and peel that back. Yeah, cool. I think I think you said it, Colonel Jason, better than I could. But in terms of the way we've done strategic planning, isn't as traditional to what you see corporately, mm -hmm. and it's not that finite. It's the future, what we want to create, and I, basically, I can just second what Jason was saying: is it's we look at it very differently. But I understand that coming from a corporate standpoint or any other standpoint, it's how do you explain to the community what that means and how it is and how we look at it and why we look at it differently. And that might be more the piece of how do we explain what we're doing and why it's a little bit different than you might see at your job mm -hmm. or anywhere else or any other mission statement because the philosophy that we've built this whole work in is very different than any piece I've ever done strategic planning mm -hmm. in the past. And I do not want us to fall into let's do it this way just because everyone understands it. I think it's our role to communicate the why and the how and what it means without dumbing it down at the same time. And I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but just in terms of like, we need to, we've done a lot with this and it's given us the guidance to do a lot, especially in the last couple of years. Right, but I think we still need to get it in layman's term because uh, you know I, I work at Thompson Reuters and legal and TAP, and I will guarantee most people cannot figure out what our strategic plan is if you're not in the business sure. or in the medical yep. field. It's just words on paper at some point. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah. I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all we're trying to do is not reinvent it or recreate it, but just kind of break it down so it doesn't matter who you are or, or, or what level you're at that you can read this document and understand where we're coming from. I, I think that's the ask. Yeah, that's the ask. Yeah. And right. that's fair. Okay. Just, that, I, I think yep. just having that, that communication intent of how it works. Right. And how does that, how do those values, how do those aspirations translate into the actions that we ha take day to day as a board okay. and a district? How does that look in practice? Are our actions consistent with those? With those values and principles, mm -hmm. right. All that to say number three sounds great. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll connect, uh, Chris and I will connect with, with Dr. Gunn probably next week. And he, we just, we kind of figured that was maybe the direction we we're gonna go. So first of all, I wanna make sure that he could, he could do it and he's comfortable doing it and get his ideas. So at least it was getting the, the wheel spinning. So we will, we'll take care of that. Great, so, thank, thank you. you. Um, on to the more lighter topics of the <laughs> current budget update. That's not lighter, but Jane. You want me to pull this up, Jane? Mr. Chair, board members, Superintendent Berg, members of the community, thanks for having me here tonight. This is just going to be a short and sweet little update on our 21-22 budget. As you recall, our adopted budget for 21-22 just came in roughly at $82.8 million. And on that revenue side, that does include using about a million dollars out of our signed fund balance and roughly $1.5 million of our federal money that we received through all of the COVID funding streams that we received as a district. And so as we are progressing through the years and looking at our budgets, they're, they're coming in relatively well, uh, 
as we looked at the salaries and benefits, uh, that is the major increase on the expenditure side. And then there was, we did reinstate the supply budgets at the building level earlier this school year. So that is included in there for that increase of roughly $982,000. The increase in revenue has to do with uh, an updated projection model from the state, because as you know, when we're doing our budget, the state isn't always done with everything that they have in front of them and on their plate. It has to do with uh, changes in participation fees. It has to do with just other miscellaneous revenue that we get in through the district. And so tonight, uh, putting in front of the board a recommendation of increasing our revenue by 982,000 and increasing our expenditures at the same time for 982,000, which would still give us a balanced budget for the 21-22 school year of roughly $83.8 .8 million. We would still be using our federal money and we still would be using approximately a million dollars out of our assigned uh, fund balance. At this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. What part of this was from the federal money? Is that part of this amount? Yep, 1.4 million roughly. Okay. Yep, that was in the adopted budget for 21-22. And where did those funds go? Uh, mostly to class size. Okay. So by approving this, Jane, where could the 982 thousand for the enhancement where is that specifically being pulled from it's additional revenue it's additional revenue and additional expenditures to give you a zero okay. change in our fund balance okay so we run different jane runs different has software through the state so she runs different simulations and based on our adms and other formulas and things that change those adjusted and so so when we move forward with this, this, this comes up to, to my other question. When we talk about our financial state that we're in, is there a way, since we approved X amount of dollars, Jason, for you to go back and to look at opportunity where we can reduce stuff? Is I know in years past we would get a, you know, here's 20 things that we're looking at to reduce. You know, it could be, I'm just making this up. Yep. Um, it could be we're not going to do busing at all. And here's the save. This is what we're going to save for the dis district, but yet here's the impact of it. Okay, here's the next item. It's going to be supplies. Um, this is what it's cost, but yet here's the impact to the district. Do we have a list like that that we so can there, see? Th there, there is no list this year because if you remember back, the board did two different things through our budget process. So we always go back and we and we realign to our enrollment. And so we remember we're down 400 ADMs from two years ago. So that's about $2.8 million yep. in revenue. And then we're projecting being down um, 180 students when we go ahead and we go through that process of, um, of right sizing. And so when we right size, that, that's part of the budget reductions right there. Yep which also includes um, some of our, our, our specialists in the elementary because we're gonna be down sections and things like that. So that was a portion of it. And then the other thing that the board approved when we went through our parameters was continuing um, the reductions that we had made for this year in the supply budgets and the capital budgets yep. and moving back to what we had in policy for our class size. So we upped that ratio by one. And so that upping that ratio by one and then um, reevaluating how we're gonna um, work through our gel programming and provide those, that covers the deficit. We don't need to go beyond any of those things right now to, to meet the $1 million net that we, we have. And just to clarify, this topic, right, is for the 20, 21, 22. I believe that's and, what that was Steve yeah. was asking. Okay. So, so last year when we had, we made a $700,000 reduction, right? right? So when we made that reduction, we bit and pieced that thing together because on the other side of it, remember we said, we're going to make a plus one to the ratio if the state doesn't do anything and we're going to reinstate that. Yep. So the mm -hmm. state came through with the additional funding. We reinstated that, mm -hmm. but we kept 
the other pieces to get to that $700,000. So a couple of positions, a Mars position in the district office, um, a shift over from um, uh, staff development, um, you know, the, the budgets that we're talking about and things like that. Those were the pieces that are the increase in athletic fees and things like that. We made that adjustment last year, carried those forward. When we did these other pieces, we only really needed to do the two pieces that we talked about to get to that $1 million net for this year. And the two pieces we specifically talked about were? The plus one ratio. Well, okay. Yep, and then looking at how we're going to support enhanced learning at the elementaries. Okay. Those were the thing. I mean, because when our, when our administrators started looking through, we had kind of already gone through a bunch of those smaller items to get to the $700,000. We weren't going to get to the net $1 million without, you know, going through a bunch of programs and changing all those programs without going for plus one. And our recommendation was to, to make that move back to policy since we were already below policy, move back to policy to what we were, and then that one additional piece would take care of that. So there was, I mean, there was different things that we, we had talked about, but in some combination, we were gonna have to increase the staffing ratio. So we just made the decision and the recommendation through that to make that one move back to policy. And, okay. you know, you're talking about you know, for that, that's 10 FTE. In addition to the other right sizing, it was three at the elementary and about seven at the secondary when we increased that. And that gets you pretty close to the million net. And I appreciate this, Jane. You've done a great job of documenting and stuff. But moving forward, I'm very cautious with, with anything in the budget because uh, speaking just... Um, I just feel like there are things that the district is spending that are wants versus needs. What, what would be an example of that? A COVID coordinator. So, so the COVID we so COVID coordinator. Okay. So, um, we actually allocate our COVID coordinator is our district nurse. So she's our COVID coordinator. We have multiple people supporting our COVID, but that's out of federal funds. That's not, that's not money that can be spent anything else. And to be honest with you, it's incorporated with our testing. There's nothing else that we can do with that. Okay. We also have numerous certified nurses, want or need. I, I mean, I would like to know just in, in a whole, I just think that each, each. I would rather see a, um, I would rather not see us lose talented teachers due to budget cuts. I would rather see what what is a want and what is a need i i'm very fearful for our band program i'll be honest with you without mr grothy supporting those kids coming up through middle school into the farmington high school so i think we're going to start seeing a trickle down of effects so um i was kind of shocked to hear i heard from a community member who was upset about it um and i just I don't know, I just think that there's other areas that we can cut on. And I don't know if I ever remember, and I talked to Steve about this, that there were any sports cuts. I mean, we took $100,000 out of our general fund for turf. And, and sports is set up the same it was, way. It was, so just, so clear, I think it was, just, wasn't just, it? just to be clear, the no. $100,000. I'm, the, I'm talking general fund. The turf, the turf was not paid out of our general fund. Okay, none it was, of it was taken, okay. And it was $800,000. And it was out of, out of bond money. Out of bond money, because yep. we needed to use that to get those updated. So I, I, I understand, um, but when we, we step back and we look from a, a big picture, all of the things that we have are valuable. Nobody's dismissing that there isn't things of value. Right. And so to say that there are wants versus needs, I think is an unfair way to categorize different things that we have available for our, our learners in, in our district. Um, just a, a quick historical thing, and I don't have all the information, but we went through some significant <laughs> reductions um, in 2011 or 12, mm -hmm. um, and those included, you know, reduction in class size, things like that, and also numerous cuts um, throughout the district. It impacted our administrative assistance, um, it impacted um, pos those positions, the hours that they worked. 
It impacted our administrators. They lost additional days and things like that. When we brought things back, we brought back the staffing. We didn't bring back the, those, those hours for those administrators, the days and things like that. So um, we have been very fortunate to be able to continue to um, work at a staffing level below what's, what's at policy. We just aren't at a position that we can do that anymore. And unfortunately that does impact um, some of our staff members. I just feel like sometimes when there are budget cuts, it's unfortunate that the arts get cut first. And I, it's frustrating, so, so, frustrating so Rebecca, not to I, so, see. Rebecca, I'm, I understand your point, but right now our buildings aren't done staffing. They aren't done sectioning. No, nobody knows, staff don't even know what the full impact is going to be. I understand that one of our staff members shared that there's going to be a 1.5 cut FTE to band. That's not accurate. I can tell you that that's not accurate. I shared with the board last night, and this is, we're not done with this. I shared that information with the board last night yep, about what that piece is going to be. Unfortunately, when we're looking at a $4 million deficit, which we're covering 3 million of it with one-time money, which creates problems down the road. And, and we are fortunate to have that, but, right, but that, but, but that exponentially, exponentially grows that deficit. I mean, if nothing changes with our enrollment and nothing changes with um, the state funding, we're looking at a four plus million dollar um, deficit next year. And we do have some money set aside to support that in a, an assigned fund balance, but it, it, it could be another million dollars worth of cuts down the road. Well, and the one thing that frustrates me, I'll, I'll be honest, I talked to board member Carrero about this today, is when we were talking about, and, I, and I'm, this is all I'm going to say because we can talk about this at a, at a later point too, but, uh, you know, when we were looking at some contract negotiations and, you know, there was a, a difference, I think about what would that difference have done if we would have held our ground and what that, how that would affect us with current deficit. So I, I've got all these questions. And, so I, I want to, I just want to interject so. real quickly because I know we've got another item on the agenda on yeah, capital budgets and I want to make sure that we're respectful of Jane's time on this and stay yeah. focused on this specific topic. Mm -hmm. well, I, so, sorry, so sorry, again, Jane, I'm just, I, I, I know for, this conversation will continue at some point. Yeah, yeah, for context, context, just for context, I understand there's lots of bits and pieces to this. Mm -hmm. The number one driver in our de deficit is our declining enrollment. That's, oh, that's the number that one driver. That so I that, so I understand there's other things that, um, that we could potentially look at and say, yep, bits and pieces here. When you're down 400 ADMs, it, it is going to be impactful. Right. So that's the number one driver. Right. And I do know we're not the only school district that no. is in this position. So I know well, they, we, they did an AMSD any... piece, right? I mean, it was 85% of the Metro districts are, are yep. doing that. So sorry. It's okay. I mean, it's good conversation. I just right. know that it's going to come back up. Yeah, when we've yeah got no, absolutely. That, I just wanted to mention that about the budget because I, yeah, that was a piece I didn't mean to dive into too much, but. Darn it, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. Thank you, Jason, for. Good. So tonight, the, it, this is just for conversation, and then at our next board meeting, we'd actually approve it. So if anyone has any other questions. And when you say approve it, I mean, we're approving basically the receipt of this report. Essentially, that's the update on the budget. There's not like a... Well, you're approving the budget. I mean, so we're amending the budget. So you're going to approve, approve the amended the budget. Yeah. At the the current, yeah. yeah, so this yeah. is just report. But it's in line with parameters we've already discussed. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. yeah, so, yep. But And this is for the current school year, the 21-22, yes. the one yep. ending. Correct. Yeah, I don't the have 22-23 done yet. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thanks. All right, our next item on the agenda, um, as uh, Board Member Saucer announced uh, last meeting, she's, uh, her family is moving out of state and uh, is leaving the board. So, um, and as a result, you have to live in the district to serve on the board, so. <laughs> Can't do it remotely. Even in the age of Zoom. Even in the age of Zoom, there's, there's some requirements here. And, you know, we'd keep you if we could. <laughs> Um, but but we're going we're going to have to um, we're going to have a vacancy on on the school board, and 
I, um, I reached out to MSBA um, when I first learned that there was, you know, that this was coming up. Um, you know, the term, uh, Melissa's term ends anyway at the end of the year. Uh, December 31st is the last day of your current term. Um, there's two other members on the board there. So there's going to be um, a, a friend reached out to me earlier and asked about this and said it's an off election year. And I said, well, actually, it's an election year. Um, but I just don't think a lot of people know about it yet. Yeah. Um, with the uh, with the midterms for Congress and everything else is also an election year for ISD 192 and probably lots of other school districts across the across the state. In any case, the question becomes, do we have to fill it? And the answer to that question is, yes, we do have to fill it. I'm just kind of walking through a lot of background here because um, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota statute uh, 123B09 sort of details some specific requirements about what we need to do. And I've filled this, I've you know, provided some background on this in our, in our notes, but it's probably worth repeating. Um, but yes, we do, the, the, the statutory language, uh, as the folks at MSBA say, says shall fill, not should fill. So we have a legal requirement to fill the seat. It can't just wait. Um, if, I guess if you were leaving the board in November, we could let it slide for 60 days because also according to that same statute, after we appoint someone, they cannot actually be sworn in until 30 days after that date. So I, anyway, I took in some of this information about how, you know, what the statutory requirements are, and then started thinking like timeline, and also some some different paths. Um, I asked MSP, what do other districts do in this situation? I asked Jason and then Lori to look into what has this district and what do area districts do, um, passed, um, and and there's kind of some consistencies, and there's also just some options. Um, Many districts will, especially for such a short-term appointment, um, will will look to a former school board member. And you know, at the end of the day, this isn't going to be you know a public election. There will be an appointment, sort of like city council has gone through here in Farmington. Um, and and so we will come to a vote around an appointment to someone to fill the last six months of of Melissa's term. I would like to see that vote take place on May 9th so that that individual can be sworn in on June 13th. To vote on the appointment. To vote appointment. on the appointment, right? So we have some time between April 11th and May 9th to deliberate about how we would want to uh, go forward. There's really two paths. One is, I've already said, you know, we could identify a former board member um, and, and come to an agreement on that. Or the next path is, you know, opening it up to public application. and. I've, I've made some phone calls and things like that, but I don't have a specific prescribed path that I necessarily prefer. I want some conversation here about what is the best path for ISD 192 at this moment in time and with this, with this, um, with this seat. I prefer to see a former board member come in, um, especially because they're coming in half the, you know, half the, the year. And I know that you guys know being newer as well, it, it takes a while to get your feet wet and get going with things. So I think having a new, completely new board member may take some time to get up and running. And I would like to see us continue on the momentum that we currently have. So I do have a former board member that I would like to see, but I would, I'll pass it on to you, Kyle. Sure. I would, I, I mean, the easiest way is to do that, absolutely. Um, I go perception of community in, in, in where I struggle a little bit because I, I know a former school board member I think would be great in it. But the comment that I've received, well, you're, you would want him or her just because, you know, they're going to vote the way you would. I'm like, well, that's, <laughs> that's not accurate. <laughs> um, but I mean, again, perception is reality right, on that. Right, right, right. Um, it would be nice to open it up to the public with the parameters. These are the strict guidelines and, and wheedle it out. And, I would hope that that individual or individual's board member would throw their name in that pot as well. That's right. Um, plus, I think, um, again, I haven't decided if I'm running or not. My term is up as well. Um, so, yeah, it would have somebody coming in that would obviously, if it was from the public, I would expect that they would want to get their feet wet and learn and probably run. Sure. So there's opportunity there. Um, so I'm kind of mixed on it, to be honest with you. I, I don't know what the right decision is or if there's a right or wrong decision on this, to be honest I, with you. I see advantages and disadvantages both yep. directions. That's why I wanted to understand kind of yep. where. I didn't even think about the perception with the voting. I've never worked with this board member while I've been on the board. So 
I don't know how they would even vote, but that is a good point, Steve. I had some friends that. here this evening that enlightened me on, on something like that. And again, <laughs> perception is reality. And once you sit up here, you really don't think about that because right. we all express our own opinions, even school students. Mm -hmm. um, so. I will say that I am strongly in favor of opening it up to the public. I think it would be in direct contradiction to everything I just talked about for community engagement and transparency to then say that I support just picking someone, no matter how wonderful that person is. I'm a new person on the board. I think the fairest and most transparent way is to open it up to anyone who would be interested in serving the remaining months of this term and go through the application and interview process. Do you feel like you can comment or do you want to say What I, I, what I would just say is the historical precedence on the board, the last three vacancies have been chosen from the board of former board members. That's just what the board has done. Um, I'm just going to offer that. I don't want to share an opinion on this at this point. Okay, it's not, that's right. I don't think it's my purview. Jason, what do you think? I'm just as an administrator and having been through some of this or seen it in other districts. I think, I think the board nailed it. I mean, nailed it, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. pros and cons to both ways of, of going about that. So I know Lori started to work on an application if the board is interested yep. in, in that way. So, I mean, if, if that's the choice and whenever the board votes on it, we could hit that part with the ground running. So. Yeah, and I don't know, oh, I was just going to share, I don't know if it makes a difference. And Kyle, you can share what you heard when you were running. But one of the things that I heard repeatedly was transparency, that that was a concern of the community. So I appreciate that that was the process that worked well for the board in the past. Um, having, having been through the campaign process recently and hearing from so many community members that that was something that was important to them um, reinforces why I, why I feel the way I do. Okay. And to clarify, if I remember correctly reading the statute, because I read it very <laughs> and talked with the same people you did, I believe that 30 days allows the community to have a comment period if needed. Correct. So that's why there's the, from the vacancy to the appointment, there's that 30 days. So regardless of which way the board ends up going, there is the time for the community to weigh in during that process for better or for worse. So, and then there could be a, a change of direction if the board wishes at that point too. So yeah. there are there are, there are places for community feedback in it, no matter how you structure it. I mean, you could con consider a community as part of the decision process of the application piece, just like you'd like a superintendent. There's lots of ways you can incorporate that community transparency in how you want to structure it. But there's many ways you can do it. So if we, um, that's, thank you. Um, if we go forward with a, a public application process, I want to make sure what's clear then what happens next, right? So, and I've, 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 I've tried to lay out, it's almost like choose your own adventure, <laughs> unless you know what kind of goes on at each, at each step. So if we go that route, ultimately, <laughs> they were awesome. <laughs> if we go that route, you skip the page down, see what happens with that choice. Um, you uh, you find out that I mean ultimately there's going to be you, you play it out a couple different scenarios and I'm I'm fine with it um, no matter how this plays out because um, I, I think that this board will make a good decision no matter how it plays out. Um, we could get a lot of applications or we could get a few applications. Um, we'll set up a process for reviewing those applications and ultimately selecting who are finalists right mm -hmm. for a vote. Um, to be interviewed before? Well, I think, so there's, that's there to the, what MSBA recommends, so they've had a couple of districts that have gone through this where they get 20 or 30 people who apply to be on the school board. It's really cool, in case you didn't know. Um, all the cool kids are on the school board. Um, but, but so then what they said, they interviewed all, all of them and that became a two to three week process of interviewing people, right? So what they recommended then saying, you gotta find a way to sort it out. Mm -hmm. So then what they recommend is say, you get 30 applications, you get 20 applications, you give each member of the board one. So every board member picks one to advance forward and those become the finalists to interview. From that interview process then is the vote, right? Because you see people on paper, you see them in person, you get an opportunity to winnow it out. That is a very rational process for me. 
Um, I'm if not sure. Do, I like that. If we're going to do that before we, I mean, once we make the decision, I think we need to document specifically that. I, I like that. Just so there's no gray area and in, in how we're going to do it. And I believe what Lakeville did when, or what ISD 194 did when they just filled a position was that they also then blinded the names of all the applicants yep. so that when those people were chosen, I mean, it was, it's actually mm -hmm. ironic. It's a transparent process, but it's very opaque. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good. So how do you want to proceed then? We have to. Well, I'm, I'm okay. Let's, let's go ahead and, I mean, if, if, I don't know we don't vote on this as necessarily, but I'm feeling consensus is comfortable with moving forward with the public application process. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, I think what I, my next set of timelines were um, that we would open up the application process sometime this week and accept applications through like the 23rd of April, which is about 10 days. Is that realistic, Lori, to open it up something like that quick? It's going to be fast. When 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 yeah. when is realistic for you? That's yeah. yeah. Oh, as far as the application, I I think we can get it out there. I don't I don't foresee that being. Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. Right? Is that too? I don't want to put too much burden on her just right. for us to get this thing rolling. Not We've to... got a lot of the work already done. Okay. Kyle and Jason and I have been working on this, so. Yeah. I knew there was a couple of outcomes, so I <laughs> yeah, did my homework. Okay. okay. To we come to the work. Okay. Processes, but we got a lot of feedback from MSPA and different districts. Um, so as far as getting an application out there and, and communicating that, you know, we can put it on the district website and yep. and um, It'd be in the paper, the newspaper, and... I'm sure. And, yep. Um, so I think that's that's fine. If we get a huge response, I think then our timeline is going to be. You know, everything has to be done in the public. Okay. So. May 9th might be a challenge, depending yeah, so, on. So my, my timeline then from that was, <laughs> um, if you don't mind, and let me know if this also is unrealistic, okay? That's the most important thing. So if we closed application, say, the Thursday or Friday before the business meeting at the end of April, yep. um, Melissa's resignation notice um, states that it is effective after the regular business meeting on April 25th. Okay. We could have a special meeting immediately after so we could adjourn Melissa could officially depart the board she could go sit in the audience <laughs> and boo <laughs> I can throw things at you you can throw things at me awesome <laughs> and um, um, but we could have that special meeting and then review the applications okay. or even pre prepared to have that I nominate conversation that night proceed with the interviews that week I mean, I, I think we could make it. You're right, it is a tight. So we can set that. We, but it I mean, requires you have us. The, yeah, you have the information now to set the dates with us. Pretty much you can send us an email tomorrow and say, guys, plan on having a long meeting that night and, and to get this going. And then that night we would determine if we have a big response. Yep. We could either make the decision that night about who to vote on on the 9th or the next steps or the dates. So we just need to have open calendars the following two weeks in order to get to a final yep. decision on the 9th. I agree it's tight, but if everyone's so flexible and able to work work it through yep. I think we can so, make it work. just out of curiosity what's on the application is that something you've talked about that's a great question next um, do we have an question so can I ask you a question yep so um, if that would be your intent then would you plan to, to conduct interviews and make a decision on May 9th then? that, that was that would be my intent yeah okay. my intent would be that you know we would have that special meeting um, after the regular business meeting on the 25th and then again, it's to choose your own adventure, what actually shows up. You know, if we have five or fewer applicants, then we can make an interview really quickly. Yep. If we have a bigger set of applications, we're probably gonna have a little bit more of a conversation about how to, how to work that through. Um, but okay. then I would suspect, I would expect or aspire to have interviews the fo starting the following week. Which May 2nd week? Correct. Okay. So that we can come to the work session. Well, actually, that's not a work session. That's a business meeting on the 9th. Yep and our applicants would be presented. And we could do a public application, I guess, or we could do interview sessions here at the yep. district office. The ninth's a business meeting? The ninth should be a work session. Yeah. It's, there's only May, one meeting in May. May. Oh, that's right, yeah, I remember. I, yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know why we could make it work. Does anyone have concerns? Let me ask that, I, I know that's a tight schedule, and, and it's, does anyone have concerns about making mm -hmm. that work? The only concern that I have is that we're traveling back from Houston from the Robotics World Championship <laughs> competition. Yay. When is that? So um, we are leaving that Saturday to head home. The 30th? 
Yep, and it usually runs until about six o'clock at night and we're driving. So I will do my very best to be here on time. Barring... The 30th? Sorry, what's the what's Oh, the I thought you were talking about the 25th. Yeah, you you said you're leaving the 30th or the 23rd? Oh no, we would be coming home from the competition on Sunday the 24th. 24th. Well, you should be home. Right. Barring a flat tire. And right, that's what I'm saying, barring any, that would be my only concern. <laughs> but even though that we're gonna be down there, I would still very much like to well, we work Just with getting Jacqueline applications and whatnot to review. Jacqueline's not gonna be here, right? No. 25th. Well, we wouldn't have a quorum for the special meeting. Yeah. Yeah, Jacqueline's Oh, no, we would. Three. Four, three is a quorum. Or, yeah. No. Or. Four. Well, on the, for the regular business meeting, you're right. It'd be. But then after Melissa resigns, then it'd be yeah, a special then meeting, then three then of five. five. members, so three is a quorum. Uh, okay. Exactly. It's I, also my, a crowd. My, my other question. <laughs> three is not, three's not a quorum, no, though. No. So, Never? Or, no. It's got to be four of total seats? Majority. A majority of the body. So three. We can't um, clarify that. My other question, you enter, have you, have you talked with Jacqueline about her preferences? She's not here tonight, but she should have I some way in no. this. So I haven't had a chance to connect. I don't her. think she'd have a problem, but just saying that would be something. Yeah, well, I think okay. you've done a good job of giving us all I the heads up yeah, about true. this. Yeah, 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 I, I don't want to slow this. I mean, this is, yeah, there's, the communication has been out there. Mm -hmm. um, there's four of us here that agree, or five of us, yeah. excuse me, that agree. I would move forward with this. I wouldn't hesitate. I would continue on that path because mm -hmm. it's tight as possible right now. Yeah. Let's just get I mean, in. It's a little. It's a little bit arbitrary to say I really want someone sworn in on Jan, June third, January, June thirteenth. Um, you know, the next opportunity after that is July. But why wouldn't we make that realistic? Why don't we just? No, no I'm just saying. I'm just saying it might be a little arbitrary, but this I. Is a question. I would like to aspire to make. Yeah, that absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make it happen, Chair. <laughs> so Lori will blind the applications before they're done. sent to us for review? Um, say that again? Lori will blind the applications before they're sent to us for review. Do you want to do that? I think so. Okay. Can you do that? That's a good idea. Okay. Do you want to send the application out to the board? And then if there's any comments, we can kind of weigh that through. I think we have a process. <laughs> Hold on. I just think we need to detail it on the application too when we send it out to people the specific Dates. dates. And deadlines. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is, I mean. Yeah, you need to, con you know, we don't know the dates for when interviews will be, but we're targeting the these week, dates. Uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't be available, you can't be available. Yep. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think to even hopefully, um, whether it's helpful to provide a link to our remaining meeting dates, but anyone who's interested in joining would hopefully be able to participate in the remaining meetings and activities right, that we have for this year. Have, the interviews and everything would have to be open meetings, right? Right, but yeah. that they look at our future meetings and can come oh, to them. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I missed you. Yeah. <laughs> um, for this year, 2022. And then I think, you know, requirements to for the application. I think there was a few questions and then what? You attach a resume and anything else? Cover letter. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Sounds good. Cool. Uh, so the last item on the this part of the agenda is the item that was added at the end and we can continue our discussion about capital budgets. I guess since I raised it, I just want to discuss one thing that's been made light in the last couple of weeks to me is I didn't realize the impact that the capital budget did have on the band program. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about how that planning works in the process and kind of what has gone on, has gone on with it, kind of what I'm looking for. And maybe even what capital budget means for anyone listening, how that's different and from... And explaining how yeah. it works as a district. And not just, yeah. I mean, basically what's part of the capital budget and how that process has looked and grown or shrunk over time. I think it helped too. I mean, you've provided some information um, in some letters in response to the community and certainly to the board in the past couple of days too, Jason. I think I read a few things online uh, and in some of the community boards that weren't true, just like you know some of the comments you made motive earlier. I think there was a, a comment about diverting money to testing. Not true, right? I don't know where that came from. I know that's certainly not anything I've gotten from you. Um, so I'd like to provide you an opportunity to kind of clarify kind of what the process was and what things look like. You've provided this, yeah, anyway, I know the details out there, so. So process for, I guess, so uh, no, just, I'll, let, I'll let Jane, okay. I'll let Jane talk about capital, so she can mm -hmm. explain what capital budget is. Come on back, Jane. <laughs> Come on down. Oh. Sorry, Jane, I know you want to stay One dollar. 
<laughs> so capital budgets are dollars that have what we in education and public sector called strings attached to them. There are there is a statute out there what you can and cannot spend the dollars on. I don't have the statute number off the top of my head, but it's it's out there. It's under either section 123B or 4 for something, for 56 or something like that, that will explain what you can spend. But basically, it's supposed to be technically over $500, have a useful life of over three years. Now yeah. there's some play in what you can and can't exception wise, but basically that's what capital dollars are. And it is a separate funding stream Equipment. from the state for it. Thanks. Mm -hmm things sure. equipment tangible things tangibles mm -hmm. yep. so then i guess to add on so like I, I shared before one of the reductions that was made as part of um, our budget realignment for this year which was included in that seven hundred thousand dollar reduction was um, a 25 percent reduction to building supply budgets a 25 percent reduction to building discretionary budgets and then a 50 percent reduction to um, capital budgets and so the the areas that have capital budgets so each of our buildings have a capital budget so our five elementaries their combined capital budgets for this year was 20,753 um, our two middle schools combined and they're a little bit different because it's based on on some different things but that combined was 13,662 uh, the high school, clearly the biggest building's budget uh, was 19,962. Uh, Co-curricular, which is really our athletic program, their budget for this year was 600 and, or sorry, 6,645. And then the band capital budget was 15,000. We also have technology, which has a capital budget. And I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I know that they um, carried a $90,000 Reduction. Reduction. So they carried a ninety thousand dollar reduction to their capital budget. What was that? As, Did you say? Uh, technology. So yeah. technology has their own capital budget. So as part of this, their reduction was um, ninety thousand dollars. So like I said, um, in, instead of tasking our administrators with going back and trying to we didn't feel we were in a position based on our finances to reinstate those to pre um, you know 22 or 21 22 budget so back to what it was in 2021 and instead of asking our administrators to go back and find an additional you know 250 300 thousand dollars in reductions we moved that that forward so that was part of it actually can't be considered a cut because it wasn't part of the bud. I mean, it, it, it moved forward, but it wasn't part of the net one million because it wasn't in this year's budget. We can't double count that as a reduction. So. so when we do that, do we go to those directors and say, OK, Jane, we're going to we have to take one full time employee from your budget. This is going to be the impact and this is how we're going to notify them. Uh, so our so our building so what happens so what happens is uh, 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 our buildings will get a staffing allocation right okay and that's based on the ratios that we use yep. and then they are responsible for staffing their buildings now in the elementary building it's a little easier because mainly most of their staffing that comes out of that ratio is classroom teachers so that's a little bit easier to follow right you increase increase the staffing ratio at the elementary your elementary class sizes are going to go up, um, you know, around, well, it depends because we have a range, but they're going to go up. So the buildings will look at, like they do every year, they'll look at and say, okay, what do I have for staffing? Where are our number of kids in each grade level? And they'll make determinations on that. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than saying you're responsible based on that staffing. They'll look and see, okay. Um, it, do I have more staff than I need this year? Or do I have less staff? But then also part of that conversation is, does that staff, can that staff, do they need, contractually, do they need to be filled out? And can that be done somewhere else? Or is it going to be a reduction? And there are places that, you know, we have more 
and, and because of the contract, right, with a, with a lot of our staff, the, the non-tenured staff are the ones that get reduced first. And so even though a building may see a reduction, if they don't have any non-tenured staff, that may hit an, another building. So it's, it's more than just saying, okay, blank building, you know, you need to reduce by this. It comes out of that staff. So do you have a choice? If, you, if it's a full-time head as a principal, do I have a choice that I could take two part-timers or do I have to start with a full-time? It, well, it's, it depends. It all depends on what people have rights to. So there is the possibility that they can bits and pieces together. Like I said, the elementary is a little bit more difficult because right. typically it's in halls. The secondary building, they get a staffing and then they look at that staffing from the district based on the ratio and they have to they have to basically fill the entire building right so they have to fill content teachers they have to spill fill any elective teachers and things like that and it has to cover prep all that other good stuff then they look at that ratio what they have for registrations potentially what they have for limits on class sizes because there's certain classes you can't be so big but there's also class there's also decisions that will be made to say that i'm going to run these classes in this department a little bit smaller because of lots of different things and we're going to run these a little bit higher to offset that okay you know what i mean so like when i was the principal at the high school i'll use math for example so the math department we worked with them and talked with them they had x number of staffing it had to cover all their classes one of the things that they wanted to do was keep their class sizes smaller in intermediate algebra that ninth grade class so they actually had more sections of intermediate algebra. It didn't mean they got more staffing. It meant that staffing had to be absorbed somewhere else. So their algebra twos, their higher level math classes would run higher. Happens in a lot of departments that do that. So there, it's more than just strictly a staffing ratio, but the, they'll look at all of those things. And then again, they'll take into account do I have to keep somebody whole? Can I keep some? I mean, there's all sorts of different things to that go into so, that. And I'm going to make this up because I don't want to call out a sure. program. So say uh, two middle school, two elementary schools has home ec class. We decided we're going to get rid of home ec throughout the district. But as a principal, I'm going to decide, you know what? I can use this one head to allocate to keep a home ec class. Well, if we were deciding to cut something all district wide, yep. um, it would be that reduction. Now, again, buildings have discretionary staffing that they can use that they could. So if the district said the district support for this program is no longer going to be available, right. but a building said, based on the needs of my building, I want to take a, some of my staffing and, and support this in a different way. Yes, they could do that. See, that's where I think the public does not understand that. Part of it because, well and that's the thing that I, I'm not even sure it, it's we, confusing we, we try to con to communicate that so ultimately ultimately the the building administrator has a lot of autonomy and how they use that staffing right. and so you know I mean they our elementary buildings will make choices that you know even though this group of kids you know it, it says it should be like this I may use an additional step because there's there's different things that we need to support in that. Right. But then again, it would have to be offset in a different you know, part of the building. So they have that ability to do that. And um, you know, again, it's a strength. You know, it, I mean, it may be confusing, but that's kind of a strength. Well, depending, it, well, depending what school you go to, sure. is my argument. It depends on, that. on the question. Well, yeah. but, yes. it, but again, right? The, each building has different unique needs and things like that. So there are buildings that have chosen to use some of that discretionary thing for other things that buildings don't feel like they need. And so it, they have to continually balance that out, but ultimately that'll be a, a decision that an administrator will make. So then could a kid go from one elementary school to the other elementary school then because that school's keeping that program and that one's not? You're talking about open and rolling it within the district? Well, there, again, it, well, I know. There, there's, there is, again, I, I'll, I'll, there's, there's, there's support, but that support's going to look different than the current, than what potentially programming might be. So again, we have students that open and roll all the time throughout the district right. for different things. Now, can, can somebody, asked to open and roll we have a timing period it depends if there's room in those buildings and things like that we allow people to make those choices 
but again, you know, it, it, we, this year will probably be different because of our increase in, increase in our, our staffing ratio. We, we're not going to have as much room as we've had early on. It's going to be much tighter earlier on than it was in the past. I guess my question, I'm going to come back to that capital piece in terms of like when um, areas that are affected by the capital are told or informed that they're going to have a reduction made. Are there any plans made within the departments or within the program that's affected to make plans to see how they can get back to that level? If there's ways to kind of modify it to kind of get to a more functional level? Well, I would say that all of our, all of the areas that have been impacted by their, their capital would like to get back to their level and believe that it's going to impact them in one way or another. I think when our, 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 our building principals, and they're the ones that were part of this process and they understood, right, it, it's going to impact their ability to furnish their building, replace things and stuff like that. So I think I understand what your question, I think I understand what your question is, but I, I think all of these groups i mean technology for sure would like to get those pieces back and stuff um when we talk about like the esser funding and the different funding where you see all the different esser levels have any of those those extra streams been used for some of the deficits we've seen in the capital budget no we've used that to keep our staffing. our staffing levels where we are because i mean i would argue that some of these programs especially bands had you know the esser funding was designated to help levels of things that were affected by the pandemic. And one thing that was very difficult was our musical groups because it was harder for them to function in a group setting. For example, in middle school last year, they didn't have a group setting for bands and that does affect enrollment numbers when it's hard to support a child that can't even go to their ensemble. So I'm just looking at some of those things of like how we can be creative to support these programs that we have with the different funds we're getting. I understand that we need to staff in issues. I understand that we have sub-issues, but I would really like to see a way that, and, I, and not sp specifically all of these that I've had cuts, like how can they work on ways to kind of make it so that their program can function that as efficiently as possible within the realms of funding that we receive? So we've, we've tapped out our, our federal funds. Um, you know, we're, we're planning on using the rest of our federal funding to offset the $4 million deficit for this coming year. I mean, again, I, if, if the board wants to reinstate, look at these different things, the board can most certainly direct us to do that. We can do that. Our question as administrators then is where do we want those funds to come from? You know, and um, our administrators my tree's spend dead. a lot of time. My tree's dead. Your tree died? Our, spend, our, our, our administrators spent a lot of time yeah balancing all of these things I, I do I understand um, you know perspectives and impact and things like that the, the hard part is 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 that when we're looking at a net million dollar reduction regardless of where the reductions happen in our district somebody or something is going to be impacted by that um, I'll, you know a lot of times you know you'll Places will say, you know, low hanging fruit, um, you know, trim the fat. And to me, those are actually are quite kind of offensive terms because I think everything that, everything that we have adds value in some way or another. Every person that we have a part of our system brings value. And regardless of where the reductions take place, that is just going to add an additional burden to someone or something along the line. And again, I, you know, I mean, ultimately, the board's going to approve the budget in in June. Um, you know, we do have staffing timelines and things that that we need to meet. But, you know, I mean, if, if the board is interested in, in in we don't have we have exhausted our creative ways to to do that. I mean, we really have. Um, but I think if, if the board feels it's important to reinstate one of them or all of them, um, I think the board can certainly do that. We would just need to know where we want that to, to come yeah, from. one to one. Yep. I, I guess from my standpoint is, well, first, there's no easy decision. And I, you know, we're all in a tough seat, not just you on this thing. And, and I was surprised when I saw that. I had no idea until actually public con contacted me about the, what was going on with the band thing. And it, it would have been nice to get a heads up 
And it, I, I think it would have been a nice to have a conversation with possibly the, the booster clubs because they are the taxpayers are the ones that are have been funding a lot of this programs for us, not just for band, but for athletics. Sit them down at the table, go to the collaboration part and say, is there anything, here we are, we're, we're, we're at this crossroad and we're looking to do this because our numbers are down significantly and we're reaching out to this specific booster club group, whatever it may be, and say, hey, is there any way you can help do that? And, you know, for one thing that came up, which I thought was a great idea, and that's why I asked the question about, you know, selling band equipment in, in the vehicle and stuff, very creative idea to do that. Mm -hmm. And I always saw, again, shame on me as a board member, I assumed that that money would go back to the program on that. Could someone explain why it doesn't go back and, to the program to me? Because yeah. I'm not aware of that. Back up yep. a little bit because you're getting way deep that you need to back up to explain where you're going. Well, I got to finish talking first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. So, so I'm like, well, how creative, you know, out of all the groups, and I've been president of several booster clubs out there, and I have never seen a more creative group that comes up with just crazy ideas that work to raise money for the groups. Very successful at it. And a lot of money. I remember the, the, the band uniforms, the astronomical amount of money that I cannot to this day believe they raised. Just reaching out and having that conversation with them saying, hey, we're in dire need here. We're coming to you guys specifically as, as a school district. Is there any way you can help us? This is what we're facing. You know, selling band equipment that doesn't get used, that whomever repairs it, is there any way we can, you know, for, I'll go back a little bit, for the vehicle vehicle expense. I don't know if it was worth $5,000 and over the years we paid $1,000 of insurance on it from the district with whatever maintenance. Couldn't we deduct that and give that back to a group? I, I think in talking to Jane, right, our practice has been when the district takes ownership of something to put the back into the general fund because there's general fund expenses that go to maintaining that. That's been the practice. Right. If the board would like us to change that practice, we can certainly change that practice. I think we would want to and this may be where the policy committee might need to go to work a little bit because I think we'd want to be very clear right. about where the money is coming from because I, I, think, I, I think we want to be careful about using general fund dollars and then purchasing them because right. that, I think that could be a, yep. not a good environment to create. But I do understand the perspective <laughs> that if an outside organization buys something and donates it and that is sold we just eat whatever costs those are and then whatever minus the cost it because it does cost again to, yep. to go through that process mm -hmm. minus that goes back into um that process potentially selling like it? the okay. capital budget because okay. there's only certain budgets that can go on i mean that, that we can certainly do that i um I, I would be interested in discussing that more because i feel like the community when they've donated the van they donated it specifically for the van program they didn't maybe say here district this I, I want this to be used but this is for the band and so that's where I'm discouraged because then we had that $800 that was sold from donated um, parts from family members that wanted to contribute to the band and so I'm frustrated that it got absorbed into the general fund not being given back to the band and those instruments are not being cared for we have a hundred thousand dollars worth of instruments that I need to be cleaned and refurbished or whatever, and there's no money to do that. So my hat's off to the parents of you know donating, thinking the money's going back to the program to help them. And so my concern is, is we've got all this equity and band equipment that's not being taken care of, but yet the money that they're trying to get for that is being absorbed into the general funds. And I think we're being specific about things that we're are donated. Correct. Well, donated. See, in, that, in, that, in, fairness, in fairness to the school district, when we started this, even with, with the Schedule D stuff, with donating money for coaches and stuff, I mean, we got to be very specific on what we're talking about right. and define it. Yeah. But I don't think, as a board, we've never had this conversation because... The assumption was, mm -hmm. so I'm just saying in fairness to what has been in place, I think it, it, at this point in time, it should be open for a conversation. Uh, so, right. Like I said, we're, yeah. right. I think yeah. if, if the board wants to kick it back to right. the policy, we're, we, can, we can make that work. I think 
My concern was with some of the discussions that were going around is our ability to track some of this stuff. I mean, we right. we run very light in our finance department. It comes up in our audit yearly that we're lean, and I don't know if we can take on a bunch of this tracking. So I think if the board is okay with saying that the district's going to eat the expenses that go into upkeep and things like that and, and stuff. And when it comes time to sell those donated things, they go back into that program. I think that's fine. I just well, one, one part of that though, is remember the booster club's books are open to the district. So there's your check and balances on stuff. And there's where you could do your reduction or, or your cost analysis on if you're a booster club within the district, the books are still open, correct? Did you guys, well, that would go to the athletic director. Right. And I, I'm gonna, I don't know, this is a probably right. I'm gonna refer to, cause you and I worked on this years ago, Sue Dettinger, is a book still open to the school district to look at? Cause that was part of being the booster club was the school district had the ability to look at the books on stuff. So that would be your tracking as a district of stuff. Well, I was talking more about the tracking, the amount of general fund dollars that goes to the upkeep of something that's donated. Okay. That's yeah, what that's I was talking okay. about. Because, yeah. I mean, Thank the van is, there was significant, the van was not in great repair when we got right. it. So yeah. there was, there was, the, that's, 2020. I, but my point, so again, I, right. we, are, gonna happen. Yeah. we are, yeah. it's a conversation that I thought we would have because there's ways of doing that, but I don't think we've ever had a frank conversation and because of and this. And I think, if, like I said, we, we aren't trying to stand in the way of that. We just want to make sure that the board's just yeah. aware of all the pieces yep. that go into that. Yeah, and I think and you stuff. have to understand too, if you're going to take a donation and that donation, maybe that donor's donation is worth $500, but the repair to make it usable is $700. You know, there probably has to be just some discretion to say we can't accept that because and, the- And then just, just the other thing I think but. that, and I'm not saying this would happen, I just think we want to be wary that we don't want to become an auction house either. Right, you know, I mean that that falls yeah. on Dan. So I mean, I, I think I don't think we want to be getting donations with strictly the intent that we're going to no. flip them. Yeah. No, no, and so, oh, no. And I'm not, right. I, oh my gosh! I'm just, but that, I know. I'm just yeah, saying. I, I, I just, totally agree with what you're I'm saying. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. I'm just things sale, to think. Right? You don't see I, you don't see ISD 192 as a preferred seller on eBay. We have to define the parameters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would just like to you know if we deducted whatever for the van and there's. Even four hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. I mean, that's. Yeah. I don't know how much it costs to clean or repair an instrument. I really don't. But maybe that's one so, instrument that can be maintained or whatever. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm, I'm gonna let's I, let's bring this back up to a yeah, second. Okay. So I don't disagree so, with what you've said, Jason. So I think there's two things. One, this is helpful background and helpful discussion. I, yep. I don't know. Uh, uh, there's two. There's two components here. One is the the capital, mm -hmm. uh, restore that kind of discussion. I'm not sure where to take that from here. We might. Um, I, I, I'm open to suggestions on that. There's the second item, which I think is more clear, which is how our funds or proceeds from disposed assets donated from external groups handled. Right. I think, I feel strong that that should go to the policy committee right now for mm -hmm. drawing yes. up a, a, a district yes. policy for understanding the impact and go through the process to make sure we're, we're doing right by the district and right by the intent of those who donated goods to the district, right? Yeah. Fair enough. <clears throat> but do we want to go back to the conversation? Let's just so we can take that so yep. that, that part of the conversation, which does dive into. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, we can go. My up, saxophone yeah. needs yeah. new pads. You know, and we don't want to go into that, right? No, so, right. no, no, no. Yeah. I don't have a saxophone. And then, just from like a high school student yeah. perspective, for instance. Um, Thank you. To echo kind of Member Carrero, there's a lot. There was a lot of uh, communication. You hear a lot of rumors. I would even set hazard, uh, like, uh, just fear mongering about like what teacher's getting cut? Is my favorite teacher mm -hmm. getting cut? Is my favorite program getting cut? And I noticed you guys said um, you don't have like a master list of everything being cut this year. Um, would that be something you'd be able to make up or no? No, because you're, you're, what it'll look like, it's gonna look like bits and pieces in buildings. Yeah. It's gonna look like a point blank O of this class in this building in this building. It's not, a, a general wide thing. Yeah. It's going to be made up with bits and pieces. That's that's our our. Um, I mean, that's really what the, the the staffing pieces that have gone through every year and stuff. So, would those numbers be more accessible at like the high school level, like talking with high school administration to be like, do you, if they have a list of cuts they're making that are more uh, focused on the school? Well, if they can, they could talk to you more about what 
I mean, classes and stuff are going to look like, but our yeah. buildings, they haven't completed that process yeah, yet. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think you could sit down with Mr. Pickens. Yeah. And, and this is obviously, that's a very, like, nobody wins in a budget cut, but just, uh, yeah, it's good to know that you can uh, maybe even think about approaching an administrator to get sort of a fair answer on what's getting cut. Thank you. I think that's a fair question. And Absolutely. That, and that kind of makes me think of just in terms of like what was asked earlier when we were talking about this was in terms of um, while we did improve the plus one increase in class size, I think I think as a board member, I expected that we'd have a little bit more heads up with what that could affect. And I think that's why I was like, why didn't I ask more questions before when we talked about that? It was like, oh, well, I figured we, we would we give the heads be, up on that. We you know? wouldn't be able to see that. This is the hard part. Of, of privacy we would, well, no, we wouldn't be able to answer that. Right. I mean, we can answer it in general that it's going to impact, you know, 20 plus FTEs across the district, but we wouldn't be able to answer until all the staffing is done exactly of, of what that yeah. is going to look like. And I just want to be mindful that now we're veering off of yeah, the capital yeah. budget discussion. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. If I could share just one thought for reflection. Um, as Jason pointed out that this is an ongoing process, the budget from now, prior to now, up until June, um, that we, I hear a couple themes. One is that communication piece, that there's an interest in knowing and understanding and trying to provide clarity and truthful information in a way that people can, can process and take back. Um, and the second piece is, when we talk about need, and Jason, I I really appreciate what you said about you know the flexibility that our district offers and the autonomy by which each building offers something unique. You know, for example, I'm at Riverview, and my kids in the middle multi-age program. That's something that's not at every elementary school, and I think it's really cool. Um, so that's a that's a flexibility piece, but we may have opportunities to look deeper at our processes, and this goes back to community engagement and defining that about how are we understanding and identifying the needs. So if you're a building administrator, what does the process look like? And how can we as a board communicate that for understanding something like the other um, program we've heard a lot of, of concern around is the gifted enhanced learning program in elementary. So how can we, um, how do we, as building administrators and we as a board understand their process for knowing if this is a concern of educators, if this is something that elementary educators think that they can take on and do well if they have concerns. And then to parents and students understanding are, are the needs that they would identify and the priorities the same as what the building administrator's perspective is. And I just think, you know, there's a lot of value to be had in having those conversations and, um, you know, an example in the in the most recent paper, 196 had a budget advisory committee, um, a gifted and talented advisory committee. So there uh, there are ways that that I think we can look at how we are how we are understanding needs of the different people that make up our wonderful district and and how that's impacting our decision making and and then sharing that back with our community. Thanks. Um, <coughs> so I guess the open-ended question is, um, or maybe it probably doesn't have to be answered right now. I mean, it, it, I think when, sorry, let me ask this question. When are, refresh my memory on when budgets, need, what's the timeline for approving budgets? There's a deadline in June, right? June 30th. June 30th. Well, so. which, I mean, technically speaking, you know, that's the technical date, but we typically do it at our last board meeting in June. Right, right, right. So I, I yeah, I just kind of did the shortcut to that. What is that, June? Oh, my birthday. Oh, birthday. How very exciting. <laughs> we can pass the budget on my birthday. And one other question, Jane, because so much depends, I know you've shared about the state deciding what they're going to do after we have to make all of these budget assumptions, yeah, right? And I should actually add one thing. We, one. we took a little bit of a risk, too. If the board remembers, we built our budget with a 1% increase. Right. Right. And right. stuff. So that's an additional five thousand dollars that we're gambling that we're going to get yeah. from the state. We 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 think we're going to get something. Mm -hmm. We're crossing our fingers that they actually do what they're supposed to do, and we get more. And then we can have a different conversation mm -hmm. about things, which would be happy. Right. But there's that's another piece as well. 
Yeah. So I think what I'm getting at is I think that we don't need to make a decision about this tonight. We just need to be very close to close together about it as the financial right. picture changes. And I think we continue to so explore um, options as we go. I guess that's what I'm getting at. I mean, we've deferred one item to the policy committee. We can continue to monitor this issue. Is that fair? Yeah, I think the only thing, like um, Jason had commented, there are other deadlines when if anything is referred to staffing or anything like that, that comes sooner than June. And what do those deadlines look like? Uh, I will have to grab Marianne when she's back, but we have a we have a calendar and actually on open Friday notes that'd be awesome. Yeah, and and I believe even in our board packet, I think it it says what day we they come back with the URLs and whatnot. So okay, we can't wait till June on some of these decisions. So or we'll just have to make or we'll have to make, make other decisions. Other de if if understood, if there's no additional funding, then we would have to do other look at other ways to offset anything that we would add back in. Okay. All right. Um, if there is no other comments, I'll close this part of the agenda. And thank you, Jane, for coming back over and sitting with us. Um, the next item on the agenda, we do have a couple of administrative actions. Well, no, just one administrative just one. action. Uh, approval of the GSC LED lighting project. Uh, Dan? I know you've been doing a lot of work on this, so. Uh, well, thank you, Chair Christensen, members of the board, uh, members of the community. This will be very enlightening. Two and a half hours, you come up with good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, I'll, I will try to make this brief, so I'm not going to read through all these, uh, the first few slides, because um, we have had a number of different conversations, I know, at the board uh, table, as well as uh, communication to the board specifically. Um, so I'm going to kind of blow through these first few, but uh, the, the basic gist of this is uh, we've been investigating uh, for actually for a, a number of years uh, to try to figure out how as a district we can come up with a comprehensive strategy and plan um, to uh, move our existing lighting fixtures um, to LED for, for lots of different reasons, but I'll maybe just highlight a couple. Um, obviously, energy savings. Uh, there's a significant energy savings uh, with LED. Um, maintenance savings. Uh, what, what a lot of times folks don't realize is uh, when we have uh, equipment failures, um, uh, when it comes to uh, electrical components, um, as a district, we're not large enough. Um, to have in-house uh, electricians or people that are appropriately licensed to perform electrical work. Um, so when we have ballasts and things like that go out in, in mm -hmm. our current uh, fluorescent systems, uh, we end up having to hire that out. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite costly. Um, there's some other details in there as well. Um, and then the last piece is just kind of that, that general um, kind of hourly uh, staff um, there's also time uh, involved, a lot of time uh, involved in, in maintaining our fixtures. Um, basically, this slide says uh, currently we have very little LED lighting throughout the district. It's very sporadic. Um, and basically what we've uh, had to do is take a look at when we've had somewhat uh, some failures, um, particularly in certain areas, uh, that we look to swap out LED lighting. But it is, it is sparse. Okay. Um, uh, and so uh, the path that we wanted to take a look at uh, moving forward with is something that um, is allowed in statute under some energy efficiency projects um, and something that uh, in the documentation is referred to as a guaranteed energy savings contract and to basically cut to the chase with that is um, what this allows us to do is um, to take a different route in identifying um, contractors and the scope um, and of a project. Uh, typically, you know, you define the project exactly, you develop all your specs, you take it out to bid, and as a public school entity, in most all cases, you take the low bidder. Um, this is kind of a different process, meaning that um, the, you start with the concept of the project has to be able to be paid for by the savings generated by the project. Okay. So, um, so this next slide here then kind of gets into that, um, demonstrating a little bit about this is this is uh, a building by building breakdown, 
in terms of uh, what our estimated costs would be to take all existing lighting, this is both interior and exterior lighting um, at our campuses uh, from the current non-LED um, status to uh, full LED. Um, and then you'll notice as well um, in there, there's estimated uh, rebates. So uh, we've worked very, very closely with um, the uh, contractor as well as XL Energy and Dakota Electric, who's both of those uh, entities serve our district, depending upon the site, um, to get as close as we possibly can to what their current rebate structure would be. Um, and you can see in there, boy, my eyes are, Close, but about a little over $500,000 in anticipated rebates, um, which is great news for us. Um, XL, in fact, did some things that they have never done before uh, for our district that uh, helped um, to boost that number for us to, um, and to make this project uh, hopefully uh, you know, come to fruition. Um, purchase price that's there, that's kind of then the, the nuts and bolts of what's left over, so to speak, in, uh, in terms of cost. And then the last line there is annual savings. Uh, so if you go over to the very far right, uh, it kind of gives you the overall totals um, that, you know, what the total cost would be of the project, last rebate costs, total purchase price, you'll see there is about 3.7 million, and then the total annual savings of about $460,000. Um, and so all of that um, basically goes into the notion of, all right, so if we can save X amount of dollars on an annual basis, um, that would be guaranteed to us in terms of that savings, uh, then how do we pay for the project? So obviously we don't have that kind of cash on hand and that's kind of the whole premise behind this guaranteed energy savings pro kind of contract is that you then take those savings, those annual savings, and then turn that around and utilize that to finance the project. Um, and so in a nutshell, that's kind of what this um, slide here is showing is that uh, we worked with uh, our um, reps and uh, were able to identify uh, a leasing agent, American Capital. Um, we specified that we were not interested in going above 10 years uh, because beyond that, then your return on investment, you start to kind of call that into question a little bit. Um, uh, interest rate um, there at 255, which is actually quite good right now. Um, mm -hmm. That's why we've, for those on the board, you've known we're that happy we've been, to get this we've, done. We've, this been, we've been struggling to, to make deadlines and, and board meetings and, and some things uh, finally flush out. Um, annual cost there at four and a quarter. I did put in parentheses the, the expected savings of 457. So um, there, so we're, we're on the positive side of that, which is where we wanna be. Uh, one of the things that is an option is for the company, it's in the contract um, that we can request, ask them to come back and basically do a, an energy audit to um, kind of check where our usage is. Um, that cost is in the contract at, at $25,000. So we can opt to do that or not opt to do that, no matter what, um, we still have to be in the black in terms of um, paying for this project out of savings. Um, payment schedule, like I said, uh, and I'm not gonna, I won't go into all the details. We had to get a little bit creative um, with this in terms of starting off making monthly payments, then um, we asked and they gave it to us, <laughs> skipping some payments for, for a while um, so that we can get onto an annual cycle. It's, it's more advantageous to us as a district um, to be able to, to make annual payments versus this month to month thing. Um, but we needed to get to a point where we were actually recovering um, the full annual um, amount to pay, to, to pay for that. Helps the cash flow. Yep, sure. exactly. Yes, perfect way of saying that. Um, so that's kind of the details in there. Um, those payments would come out of um, buildings and grounds, whatever you want to call it, budgets, because that's where all of the utility and all that stuff comes out of now. Um, and then, yeah, the bottom there, uh, expenditures, you know, principal, interest, totals, um, 10 years, and I don't know, is there another one? Uh, oh yeah, schedule. Um, so contractors um, would be in a position um, per fixtures on hand and uh, you know ability, which they do have some on hand already, um, to start here yet this month, uh, early May at the latest. Um, significant completion will occur building by building. That was a conversation we had, um, but it makes the most sense from an efficiency standpoint to start building by building. Our intent right now would be to start with the high school. Um, 
which may seem odd to people because it is our newest building, but it is actually the most um, financially challenging to maintain the lighting system <laughs> in that building. At the time, it was state of the art, <laughs> um, but it is horrendously expensive to maintain, and we are uh, kind of pushing end of life with a lot of the stuff in there. Um, so whether we do this or not, um, this is the more efficient way to do it. Uh, we're going to start have a pretty significant uh, amount of lighting expenditures at the high school. Um, uh, they would they work during second shift, which is a huge advantage for us because then they don't disrupt and we can go all the way through. Uh, with the entire district, the target goal being end of January of 2023. So sorry, I know that was a lot in a, in a hurry. No, it's good review. Um, Thank you for covering it, but relatively uh, quickly. Yeah. So, um, so I guess that's yeah, that's the piece. If anybody has <coughs> questions, how firm are the rebates? Because that scares. I mean, that's guaranteed. a guaranteed. Hundred percent guaranteed. Guaranteed. So what if they pay it? Who does oh. contractor? Contractor pays it. Yeah. Fast answer. What's well, that's. that's because I said that is the guaranteed energy savings that's part of this. It, it absolutely well, and that's why they. I mean, if you once again, I don't need people to go through and look at all the documents, but if you look at the scope documents and everything else in there, I mean, it is T's crossed, I's dotted. I mean, it is down to the fixture, down to the. I mean, yep. So how do we pay them? Do we pay them on completion of the job? How do we? Um, how do we, so it would be similar to a normal project in terms of that we, that when they complete sections, progress monitored, complete sections of the project that they would send us then kind of your, your stereotypical, um, pay application when certain, when certain things are complete. So it would not, we wouldn't wait until the entire pro, just like we wouldn't on any construction project, we would pay them incrementally as materials and labor, you know, are arrived. Uh, arrive on site and are installed. So I just guess that's a lot of money to say, hey, we're hoping guaranteed and our only repercussion on that is to sue you if you don't come through and with the rebate on that. I mean, that's 500 and, because we'd be on the hook for it, correct? Uh, uh, no, I mean, the company is on the hook for it. So in this case, Noble Conservation Service would be on the hook for it. They're legally bound on the correct. contract documents. Yeah. That's that's why this whole concept of a guaranteed energy savings project is 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 different. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's why that's why we've been going back and forth with lawyers. You a asking lot. if the <laughs> rebates are then bonded? Because <laughs> uh, a friend of mine does this in North Carolina. Yeah. That I know yeah. we talked. Yeah. We talked to him yeah. about it, and there, there yeah. is a little risk here. Yep. Yeah. That's all. So, and the, the other piece too, and I mentioned this, I did get a little bit of different information this morning. Um, Excel is trying to hit some of their targets um, that they're lacking, they're lagging a little bit with some of their rebate targets. I mean, obviously the last couple of years have been a little, you know, mm -hmm. atypical. Um, and so there is the potential that these, that our rebate structure, that the structure, then this would be with Excel, that that's the better. structure would be even more favorable to us. But, you know, that's, that's not that's not guaranteed yet. yet. So that would be kind of icing on the cake, so to speak. And the way that the contract is written is that anything above and beyond what's in there um, goes, to goes back to the district. Okay. And actually, all those rebates flow through us anyway. We have to sign off on all of that because technically we're the property owner and so on and so forth. But so when we find out when we're getting the rebates, like what part of the job? So as the jobs, so as the as the fixtures are installed yeah. and things are complete then it would be built, basically it would be building by building. Okay, so that the rebates would be applied for, correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and if you if you look in the numbers a lot, you will notice, you, you will definitely notice that there is a significant difference in rebates between Dakota Electric and Excel Energy. That's, that's why, quite frankly, there's another advantage in doing this district-wide because, quite frankly, Excel Energy sites are quasi-supplementing our Dakota Electric sites. Because the, the, it just, the rebate structures are quite different. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, can I get a resolution, <laughs> or sorry, a motion uh, to approve this uh, this contract? So Do I, I need to read the form? Mr. Chair, I have a question. There are two resolutions here. Can that you is, help us understand the separation? Yep, oh. yep, absolutely. So the, the first basically is the resolution regarding the contract. Mm -hmm. um, so with Noble Conservation Solutions, the ones that would actually be doing the work. So that, that would be that, that piece of it. And then the second one is the 
um, resolution regarding the financing, the leasing aspect of it. Okay. Yep. So, no. Good thank question. You. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion for uh, to uh, to pass the? Let's see. I'll make a motion to grant yeah, administration permission to enter into a guaranteed energy savings contract with Noble Conservation Solutions LLC for a total purchase yeah. price of four million two ninety nine one ninety nine twenty eight as presented. Second. <laughs> motion by Simmons, second by Saucer. All in favor, say aye. 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 Can I'll make get... a motion to forego the reading and approve the resolution relating to the financing of equipment, authorizing the execution and delivery of a master tax exempt lease purchase agreement and related documents, including property schedule number one with American Capital in the amount of three million seven seventy three hundred seventy five as presented. Hey, can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you read the real one. Read the, uh, the full one. I'm just, I'm just glad you didn't ask, ask, make me ask for one. Uh, so, second. Motion by Simmons, second by Carrera. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, guys. Chair Christensen, um, do you mind if we take a five minute recess? The motion just for a five minute recess. Can I get a second? Second. Motion, uh, motion by Simmons, second by Saucer. All in favor say aye. 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 We will take a five minute break.
There we go. We are. We're back. All right, and we're back. Um, thanks for uh, giving us five minutes for uh, for a quick break. Um, our next item on the agenda is some policy discussion. Um, policy 515, protection and privacy of pupil records. Policy 1013, establishment and adoption of school district budget. And policy 1014, modification of school district budget. Uh, who's leading these discussions? Who's on the policy committee? It's me. Who's, it's you? And okay. it could, it's myself and Jackson, I believe. Um, okay, so you. But what I, both, most of these are pretty simple. Um, the policy listed B and C here, 113 and 114, the updates are simply from legislator, legislature and MSBA changes, nothing significant, just from them. Um, policy 515, we've changed the definition of what we want to look for for student records, and there were some, some experience in the district that had proceeded doing that, and I'd ask Marianne if she could talk a little bit more to that policy tonight. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, the policy 515, what we, ba uh, in addition to the MSBA recommended changes, the other changes are narrowing of what is considered directory information that is available to organizations that might seek information. So we are limiting it to what is absolutely statutorily um, required to be directory information. Uh, currently, um, an organization could request student name, student birth date, student address, phone number, and we wanna narrow that to just simply what is legally required. So that, that's the bulk of what the changes are with this policy. And there's not administrative action on these. These are this is a reading, and then we would, we would second, vote on them. Yeah, second reading, second and reading. then it'll be brought back next time. Thank you. Okay. Are there any um, questions? I guess we're kind of dealing with these in mass, so is that okay? I think that's okay. Yeah. Um, are there any questions from the board on any of these policies? I just like the changes on 515 regarding the directories. I think that's that's huge for privacy. So thank you for changing that. Yeah. And just, just to clarify, this is the second reading. The first reading is considering policy. Yep. It will come back to the next board meeting for an official vote unless there's any other concerns. Yep. Okay. Seeing none, we can move on. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Um, open forum for a board work session uh, is conducted at the conclusion of the meeting and must be agenda specific. Comments from visitors must be informational in nature and not exceed five minutes per issue. The board cannot engage in discussion or debate in those five minutes, but will take the information and find answers if that is appropriate. As part of the protocol, it is unacceptable for any speaker to slander or engage in character assassination at a public board meeting. We have, uh, it looks like 10 cards for speaking requests. I'll just read through them in the order that they are sitting here. So first is uh, Lindsay Saul. Come on down. All right. Um, to the lectern, right? Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Good evening. My name is Lindsay Saul. I have two daughters, both attend FHS. My daughter, Ava, is a sophomore and heavily active in choir. My oldest daughter, McKenna, is a junior and has been involved with band since the fifth grade. She's also been in marching band since freshman year. Band has been so important to her that she plans to continue playing in college. Even though Kenna has one year left before graduation and this budget cut to the band program won't affect her much in the long run, it will to the younger students, which is why I'm grateful to speak tonight and share why we think band is so important to us. I know from a parent's perspective what being in band has done for Kenna, but last night I asked what being in band has meant to her. She said that being in band has helped her during stressful emotional times. It's helped her meet new friends and new people that she probably wouldn't have otherwise met. She said she likes being a part of a family at school and it's helped her to have a safe environment to be her artistic, quirky, cringy joke telling, anime obsessed, pink is her favorite color self. I have to say that her reasons for the importance of band in her life fits in line with what I saw as well. I wanna put some examples to what she's outlined. There's many more stories, but for time constraints, I'll keep them brief. This past December, Kenna was in a near fatal car accident right outside of school. For the first week, she was full of anxiety, but the next Friday, she went to the basketball game to play for pet band. She was all smiles, playing her instrument and dancing. She was doing what she loves to do with her tribe surrounding her, letting go in a positive, safe setting. It wasn't her math quiz or her English assignment that helped her pull herself out of her head, it was banned. 
To her second point about meeting new people and friends, all these kids and all these bands share at least one common interest, the love of music, the love of playing music. Music brings these kids together regardless of their main friend groups, regardless of any differences that they might have, it's the music that unites. It fosters strong, lifelong friendships and makes more memories than any other subject in school. My daughter has forged relationships with many other kids as a result. The most recent example was our trip to Hawaii and I chaperoned. Kenna met a student in a grade below her and in a different band. They had seats next to each other on the plane and now dub each other plain besties. <laughs> that entire week they were besties and still talk even though they've been home for almost two weeks. Next on her list, is the family environment that being in band provides. For most of, us, most of us, family is something comforting. You know that they have your back and will love and support you. And with band, maybe in a kinder, gentler way than mom and dad. But the best thing is you don't have to go home to feel that. You go to the band room. I was a choir kid and our choir room was home for us. In between classes, study hall, at the end of the day, whatever the reason or occasion, we went to the choir room. I know it's the same for the band kids. I even see it at alumni events. How meaningful is it that these previous students come back for high school band events? And even more meaningful is watching them connect with the other students. Growing up is hard. Today's kids face many more challenges than most of us did growing up. Finding acceptance can be difficult. If these kids can surround themselves with others like them, it will enable them to grow in their self-esteem and be okay with who they are as people now and in the future. From my perspective, I've seen my daughter, though very responsible on her own, be more aware of how her actions can affect others. To quote Aaron Holmes, we not me. When you're on such a big team, like with band, every action you take will either benefit the team or let the team down. If you're late for any other class after the disruption, the detriment falls on the student. No one is waiting on you or needing you to be there. But before a performance or competition, you have other people relying on you so that you know your part and show up. This is such an important life lesson that can easily be learned through playing in band. I think the fostering of relationships with faculty is important. These kids look up to the directors. I saw it in Hawaii. Someone was constantly calling out a director's name or seeking them out to show them something cool that they found or that they had done. Most of the band students have been or will be in the programs for their entirety, entirety of their high school career. What teachers do you have for four years straight? These directors know our kids and our kids know them. They're a part of that family environment. They become an inter integral part of our kids' lives, which makes them an extended version of our own. With such a focus on mental health lately, and especially in our youth, I find it absurd that such an important, positive, healthy outlet would all be but taken away from them. Everything from having band as an outlet to being part of a bigger picture, a bigger family, to acceptance by your peers, all play an important part in our youth's mental health. I also wonder financially what this will mean for families going forward. We're already taxed through the nose to live in this city. We're literally being squeezed financially in every way possible. I can't imagine what financial impact this will have on individual levels. It would break my heart to tell my child they couldn't participate in something that they love because putting, the gas, putting gas in the car is more important at the moment. Right now, band is very affordable. Marching band is also very affordable, but with these cuts, I can see it becoming too expensive for some, thus creating a reduction in participants, and further down the road, the elimination of these programs entirely. Hey, Lindsay, just a moment that you're past the five minutes, just I wanna keep things moving, but if you have- if you're, I'm, I'm almost done. Thank you. Okay, and what's next? Cuts to all other music programs, to the theater programs. Thank you for letting us speak tonight. I'll end with this request. Please do not fail these kids going forward with these cuts. Please do not fail the many band families of Farmington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Derek DeWild. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Derek DeWilby. I am uh, a member of the Farmington Tiger Band Boosters, and I am a, um, speaking here tonight as a concerned citizen and also a parent of two, uh, actually three daughters in the uh, band program within Farmington. We understand that the band's capital outlay has been cut by another 50% or by 50% for the second year in a row. The band department is disproportionately affected by cuts to capital outlay 
since it is the one and only source of funds for the purchase of new instruments and equipment. This is for a band program that supports nearly 1,000 families in our district in grades five through 12 total. Many of these instruments and equipment can cost many thousands of dollars each. Without that capital outlay provided to the band program, it would not be possible for many students to participate in the program and itself would be lacking many key elements of the program because they do not have the funds for them. For historical context, the capital outlay budget for band was $50,000 annually until about 10 years ago. At that time, the budget was cut from $50,000 to $30,000 a year, where it remained until last year. Last year, this budget was cut by another 50% to only $15,000. That's $15,000 for the entire band program, grades five through 12. The boosters understood that this was a one-time belt tightening maneuver due to COVID, and therefore the booster club stepped up to provide the additional capital funds that were cut by the administration. However, last month we learned that the administration was again proposing and the board approved this 50% reduction for another year, keeping that budget at $15,000 again for the year for the entire band program. While the booster club worked to fill a gap temporarily last year, it should not be the responsibility of the community to purchase basic instruments for a curricular class like band. Additionally, the band program provides a tremendous amount of goodwill and support to the community through dozens of performances annually in public concerts, community events, think of Veterans Day, community celebration, Memorial Day, due days, parade, I could go on and on, pet band at countless sporting and school events, and so much more. It should also be noted that the band program in grades five through 12 today is much larger than it was 10 years ago, yet is being supported with a nearly 70% reduction in their instrument and equipment budget. We have a responsibility to the students and the community to, to, to ensure that there are playable instruments and equipment available to support this fantastic program and the students that participate in it. We urge you to consider restoring these cuts to the band program. Thank you for your consideration. Good evening. Thank you very much. Next up is Bill Poor. Uh, good evening, Chair Christensen and members. Uh, my name is Bill Poor. I live in Farmington. I'm a longtime member. I'm, I'm actually a founding member of the Farmington. I, sorry, it's a little out of my comfort zone here. <laughs> Uh, uh, of the Farmington Tiger Band Boosters. I'm a very proud parent of two students, um, both currently involved and recently graduated out of the, uh, the band program. And uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. This is important. I'm speaking tonight out of concern um, that I have specific to the age of the instruments in our band program. The reductions to the band's budget for the purchase of new instruments over the past 10 years and especially the past two means that students are being asked to play in instruments that are extremely old and require frequent repairs. For example, we recently learned from the band directors at the high school that the average age of the bass clarinets at FHS are nearly 30 years old. 30 years old. Let that sink in for a second. What other academic department or school activity is using equipment that's 30 years old? Not only this, but the extreme cuts to the budget mean there will soon be inadequate funds to replace any of these instruments anytime soon. Because of the great care in which our teachers and students have handled these instruments, we are grateful that these instruments still work. But we feel the district has a responsibility to ensure the use of such instruments, allowing our students equitable access to band and education. A 10-year, detailed, fiscally responsible plan for instrument purchase and repair has been previously proposed. This would guarantee consistency and fairness while also providing long-range support for our, our outstanding bands, our state champion bands. We urge you to implement this plan. Thank you very much for your time, your attention, and your support of Farmington Music. Thanks, Thank Bill. You. 
ask uh, Cindy Kruger. Good evening, my name is Cindy Kruger. I am a parent of one former and two current band students and a member of the Tiger Rated Band Booster Club. I am speaking tonight regarding the sale of outdated instruments and the sale of donated items for the band, much of which was previously discussed, but we'd like to go on record as a booster club. Without a current plan in place for instrument repair and replacement, our creative and talented band directors authorized the sale of several old instruments that are, were no longer useful. They were costing more to repair than they were worth. Instead of collecting dust on a shelf, these instruments, all of which were over 35 years old, were sold, raising nearly $800. Instead of returning this money to the band department to repair other instruments or put toward the purchase of new ones, the bands were told that it is district policy that money from the sale of old equipment go into the district general fund. We would like to ask the board to create a written policy that would allow funds derived from the sale of old instruments to be used to purchase new replacement instruments or to repair existing instruments. Last year, the band boosters donated over $7,000 toward the purchase of new instruments for the band program because of the reduction in capital outlay. This allowed the district to purchase several new instruments at zero cost to the taxpayer. When these instruments purchased from funds donated by boosters reach the end of their playable life, we would like to see a policy in place that would allow for the monies from the potential sale of such equipment be dedicated for the repair or purchase of new instruments in the future. We would also like to note that a van that was donated to the band several years ago was recently auctioned, raising more than $2,000 for the district. None of this money was returned to the band. We know that there may have been some licensing, insurance, and other expenses incurred for the time we owned it, but we would like to see anything outside of those expenses be given to the band to be used for instruments purchases as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jackie Williams. Hi, I am also a band parent and I have two amazing kids in the band program. Couldn't be more proud of our band and as Bill said, state champions as I'm displaying for all of you today. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a member of the Tiger Band Boosters and I want to speak to you all tonight regarding a program that has been established to make band instruments available to all students. This past year, a new instrument donation program called Replay Farmington was launched thanks to the generosity of the Farmington community. Replay Farmington has been a huge success in its first year, with nearly 100 musical instruments being donated to the school. In fact, over 35 Farmington students are already benefiting from the program. Nearly all of these students would not have been in band or been able to afford the purchase of an instrument if Replay didn't exist. This program was inspired by the by in part by the district making equity a primary part of its mission in recent years. The band has stepped up to do something about increasing access to band, which can be very expensive for many families. As a booster club, the moment we heard about replay, we made a donation of $3,000 to help clean and repair these instruments to ensure that they were in good playable condition. The district was asked to also contribute a small amount of the money to help clean and repair these instruments. Again, nearly 100 instruments, but no money was ever committed to the replay program from the district. The gift of these instruments has a replacement value of over $100,000. Doing some quick math, that's nearly seven years of the current capital outlay budget assigned to the band that was simply donated to the school district. And yet the Booster Club is the sole entity that is supporting this program through cleaning and repair of these instruments. We would love to partner with the district to allocate funds to the replay program so the rest of the donated instruments can be put to use so that our band continues to grow and continues to be accessible to families of all socioeconomic backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sue Dettinger. Good evening, everybody. I, hope, I bet you guys are all hoping boosters are about done for tonight, right? <laughs> um, I have had the privilege of having uh, two children attend and graduate from Farmington schools. And tonight I'm here in my capacity as the vice president of our band boosters. Uh, this morning I sent an email to all of you that represented the points that our passionate booster members and parents spoke about tonight. You can tell how fiercely proud and protective we are about band in Farmington and that pride and protection extends to our entire community given the presence this program has on so many levels. We're not here to complain. 
We really do want to have respectful and purposeful conversation and dialogue that creates solutions to challenges. And I think you've heard a lot tonight about what we're willing to do from a booster perspective. We're so proud of how tirelessly the band boosters and all of our parents and fans work to support the band program through funding and volunteerism. What we're humbly asking of you is to create a fair and equitable way for us to partner together to do the right thing. The boosters have shown that we're more than willing to help when it comes to supporting such an amazing, successful, and active program. But it seems that the heavy lifting for much of what we've mentioned has been put in the hands of booster clubs and its donations. Um, I've been honored to have the opportunity to work with almost all of the 25 booster clubs that have been established at Farmington High School since 2017. Through the Tiger Fan Club, the boosters have donated sh just shy of a million dollars to date. And the band boosters alone have contributed close to $200,000 in just five years. What we believe is that it's the district job to help us get the kids on the field, get them on the court or the stage, or get them in a pool, or get them in the concert hall. If you guys can get them there with equipment and uniforms and coaching, boosters are gonna do our part to support anything after that. But boosters can't be responsible for everything, and sometimes it feels like we're inching dangerously close to wanting that to be our reality. So what we're kindly and respectfully and kind of begging uh, for you to do is partner with us to do what's right. If we can just start with really simple things, logical things that we talked about this evening, so funding um, the curricular band program in the same way that it funds other academic programs, create a plan for instrument purchase and repair, provide support for a replay program, and really to create a policy that ensures that instruments and other items donate, donated to the band program or other school programs or activities don't end up as part of the general fund. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, next up is uh, Nathan Kay. I just want to say uh, hello, and I just want to say thank you for letting me free speak tonight. It's uh, my pleasure. Uh, I'm talking here not just to say I'm not mad that Mr. Gorky left. It's more of I'm worried about the fifth graders transitioning into middle school band and the middle school band trying to transition to high school band. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences in middle school band and with Mr. Grothy a bit. They'll kind of get you a bit of an idea of how, what band means to me and how it could feel to a lot more other people. Cause I don't want people to miss out on how amazing band is. Cause I absolutely love band. During COVID when students were on distant learning, teachers had to do the best they could since we're not able to be together. Students could not participate like they would. Well, Students could not participate in the gym and in band, but our teachers did a great job keeping us interested and participating. Mr. Grothy was a lifeline to many of the band students. Everyone looked forward to our Zoom meetings and to what he planned for us every day. He was one of the teachers who personally saw me through a really tough time not being in school. He was that teacher who we could talk and confide in. He was our rock, and during all of this, he still made me, he still made band and music fun. If it wasn't for Mr. Grothy, I may not have signed up for the FHS band. Mr. Grothy was my band teacher, a mentor and someone I trusted. He, meant, he made distant learning bearable for me and actually made me enjoy school a bit during middle school. Thank you for, again, taking time out of your day to listen to me. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Kelsey Jazerski. I saw her earlier, but I wonder if she wasn't able to make it to stay on. Okay. Um, Jennifer Mary.
Hello, I'm gonna keep it short because I know you guys are all tired, <laughs> myself included. By the way, Kyle, not the best night to recruit school board members. <laughs> like this is gonna be fun. <laughs> there have been worse. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am Jennifer Maggie Mary. I am the mom of two fantastic daughters in the district. And um, I just wanna share my thoughts on a couple of the programs that are up for underfunding or defunding completely. Superintendent Berg, you and I had an email exchange in August after the whole mask meeting in which you shared your vision for Farmington and our education. And you said, I quote, I love this by the way, we need to cultivate the strengths, interests, and passions of each learner, end quote. I think that that is a beautiful vision for education in general and a lofty goal for Farmington to aspire to. However, some of these budget cuts ensure that that vision can never become a reality. I hesitated to speak tonight because I don't have the answers. I don't know where to find a million dollars. I wish I did. I wouldn't be sitting here if I knew where to find a million dollars. <laughs> So I, I don't want to get up here and just complain and say everyone's doing things wrong. And I know that every parent who gets up to this podium will have programs that are more meaningful to them. The programs that are meaningful to my family are gel and band, arguably the two biggest losers in the budget game. When I think about the programs that have been most meaningful and the teachers that have had the most impact on my girls since we've been in Farmington four years, it is gel and it is band. When it comes to gel, letting go, cutting gel at Meadowview means that academic enrichment is going to go from slim to none. Currently, we have no STEM. There are no advanced reading groups. Thank God for advanced math. But these are bright kids, bright creative thinkers whose potential will not be reached. And I think it's very easy to say, well, they're smart kids, they'll be fine. But underserved kids are underserved kids. Untapped potential is untapped potential. And this is a problem. It's a problem when we say, you're smart so you don't need anything extra, when these kids do. They absolutely do. Mrs. Huddle is an absolute treasure and it just breaks my heart to think of her not being a part of the community. And I, again, I don't know if that is, is what will happen with her. I really, I don't. But if, if she leaves Farmington, we will have lost a treasure. And banned. I think a lot of the booster parents have, have said it really well, but this is one of the most successful programs in Farmington. When we look at Farmington education as a whole, there's a whole lot that I don't think is going right, but BAND is doing really, really well. I mean, we are state champs, as, as people have pointed out. The Farmington BAND program has worked so hard to create a space that is inclusive to all kids, where if you wanna play, you can play, where everyone is welcome, where everyone fits in. Isn't that the standard that we want across the board in education? Band is doing it. And the fact that we're thinking about cutting more budget from them is just unconscionable to me. One thing that they've done is the beginning band program, which if you're not familiar, helps kids who didn't start in fifth grade. A lot of times in education, if you don't start in fifth grade, you are left out by the time you get to eighth grade. But they offer the beginning band that lets kids catch up and participate. And the irony to me is that band is working so hard to get more kids into it, to serve more students. And now they're expected to do it with less money. That just doesn't seem fair to me. The bottom line is you can't cut any program's funding by 50% and expect it to, expect it to stay successful for long. How long will we be state champs? Probably not very long if we can't support our, these programs. And again, I don't have the answer, I really don't. But I couldn't let these programs suffer or be cut completely without at least speaking up. Somehow we need to support the programs that cultivate the strengths, interests, and patch, passions of each and every learner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And um, our last speaker is Annika Mary. Good evening, my name is Annika Mary. I'm an eighth grader at Bachman Middle School and I'm a member of the band. Thank you for taking the time to listen tonight. I'd like to share my disappointment in the reduced budget for band. 
I moved to Farmington in fifth grade and didn't join the band. I didn't join in sixth grade either. In seventh grade, I joined the beginning band program where I discovered my love of music. This year, I played in the eighth grade band in addition to small ensembles, pet band, and middle school combined band. I went from not being able to play an instrument at all to playing the flute and bassoon. I'll also be joining the marching band this summer. This is all due to the incredible instruction I've received through the, sorry, <laughs> I've received through the Farmington Band Program, especially from Miss Gordon Mercer and Mr. Lasco. When I decided to pick up the bassoon last November, Miss GM took time out of her prep hour to give me lessons. I worked with a lot of the band directors in Farmington, and I can say that their dedication to band and their students is why the program is, is why the program is as successful as it is. <sighs> One of the things I love about being in band is that everybody is welcome and everyone gets to play. Regardless of your skill level or experience, there's always a place for you. I'm excited to be a part of the best marching band in the state. However, I worry that without the proper funding, the band program won't be able to maintain its excellence and fewer kids will be able to have the experience that I've had. I know you have difficult decisions to make. I want to thank you again for hearing my concerns and strongly urge you to reconsider the cuts to the Farmington band budget and keep the band, keep the band program strong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our uh, speakers and public comment participants this evening. Um, I would like to talk for another 10 minutes and just drag this thing out. Um, <laughs> but alas, I, but alas, and I'm sure Bill knows this is surprising, I have very little left to say. <laughs> um, that's, the end of, that's the end of the meeting. I guess um, all that we need is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Saucer, second by Guerrero. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>